<coughs> morning.
Morning, Mr. Swazi. Chairman, Glad you're here, buddy. The Ways and Means Committee will come to order. The Chair has determined that a quorum is present. Today we meet to continue our consideration of this committee's contribution to the Build Back Better Act. Before we turn to debate today's business, I want to make a few brief reminders. First, consistent with regulations, the committee will keep microphones muted to limit background noise on the WebEx platform. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for five minutes. Second, when members are present remotely in the proceeding, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. Finally, please be advised that consistent with the advice of the Office of the Attending Physician, members, staff, and guests present in the hearing room must wear a mask except when recognized to speak. I appreciate everyone's continued patience and cooperation as we take reasonable precautions to keep our families safe and communities safe. And now, let me turn to today's business. We continue our markup of the Build Back Better Act after a truly historic two days last week. Last Thursday, this committee advanced investments to provide 12 weeks of paid leave and medical leave for all members of the American family. We took action on affordable child care, and we have expanded opportunities for workers to save financially for secure retirements. And on Friday, we approved funds to strengthen pro-worker trade programs, expand health care benefits in Medicare, grow our health care workforce, and protect America's elderly and people with disabilities in nursing homes. Millions of Americans' lives will change for the better 
thanks to these provisions. This week, we will build on that progress. The proposal we will consider over the next two days includes additional investments in the American family and the American economy. Emphasis on the term investment. We will invest in the development and deployment of clean energy, take bold steps in the fight against climate change, and create good jobs, lower prescription drug costs, close the Medicaid coverage gap, enable greater infrastructure development, and broadly help Americans live healthier and more financially secure lives. We will do this while responsibly funding our investments. Those who, in the 2017 tax law, left behind also took the hardest financial hit during the COVID crisis. Meanwhile, the big and strong and the wealthiest Americans who saw the most substantial benefits from the 2017 tax law indeed fared much better. As the stock market rebounded quickly and soared to new heights, we saw again greater concentration of wealth. We all read the reports of widespread stock buybacks and CEO bonuses that occurred thanks to those changes in the tax code. Business didn't use their new savings to always lower consumer prices or raise workers' wages. Mega corporations didn't need that law to stay afloat. We celebrate success in this great nation that we all love. But we can also ask the biggest companies and the ultra-wealthy to contribute a bit more to the common good. That's why our proposal today asks those in this nation who are doing extremely well to pay a bit more to support the services and the infrastructure on which our society and often their business and investments rely. While the increases that we propose today will go a long way in responsibly paying for our planned investments, the rates will still remain lower than they were in the 2017 tax law. And despite the rhetoric we will hear today, the truth is we have carefully made sure to protect middle-class Americans and small businesses from experiencing any tax increases. We can argue and discuss the issues of greater wealth concentration in America as to how it happened. But what we can't deny is it did happen. The arguments over worker skills, the arguments over globalization, the arguments over the decline of unionism in America, and the advances of technology have all contributed to that greater concentration of wealth. We take steps today to help provide broader opportunity for the American family. The proposals that we consider in these days are about expanding those opportunities, increasing equity, and demonstrating our commitment to fairness. We're going to hear arguments about punishing success. No, this is about infrastructure. We're going to hear arguments about being punitive. No, this is about infrastructure. We're going to hear a series of arguments about the proposals we have today, and the conclusion is the following. This is about infrastructure. I look forward to describing them in greater detail shortly, and that will allow me now to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Neal. This is truly a historic day. Never has our government wasted so much to kill so many American jobs, drive prices even higher, and hook a whole new generation of the poor on government dependency. This is an economic surrender. China, Russia, Europe, and Japan are cheering. This is trillions of dollars of wasteful government spending to fuel inflation even further. This will raise taxes on the middle class and small business. This is easily the biggest economic blunder of our lifetimes. Don't look for much common sense here. When prices are growing faster than paychecks each and every month President Biden's been in office, how does it make sense to heap on another three and a half trillion in government spending that will drive prices up higher and last longer. When businesses are fighting to recover from the COVID pandemic, how will raising their taxes help them get back on their feet and get Americans back to work? After the U.S. Le leapfrogged to the most competitive in economy in the world following the Republican tax reform, what are we thinking? Saddling America's businesses with higher tax rates than communist China and most of the world especially when it guarantees U.S. jobs, research, manufacturing, investment are driven overseas. You remember, 
It happened all the time during the Obama-Biden White House. And who gets hurt most? Workers and communities pay the price when jobs move overseas and when businesses are forced to send their money to Washington to be wasted rather than invested in their workers in their local communities. How does it make any sense to take more of what small businesses work so hard to earn, leaving them even less to spend on growing their business and hiring more? Why in heaven's names are Democrats exposing even more family-owned farms and businesses to the horrible death tax, forcing them to sell their land or business to pay the IRS rather than hand down their lifetime of work to the next generation? This hurts multi-generational farms and women in minority-owned businesses. Who thinks it makes sense to give up American sovereignty of our tax code so we more, look more like foreign countries, favoring foreign companies and workers over American ones? And make no mistake, the Biden tax bill raises taxes on the middle class. Just ask the Liberal Tax Policy Center, who states nearly three-fourths of middle-class tax uh, workers will see higher taxes starting next year and up to 90% in the future. The Joint Committee on Taxation also agrees the lower middle class families bear a real burden of the corporate tax hike. It's disheartening with so many families struggling with devastating diseases like cancer, ALS, Alzheimer's, mustard dystrophy, and Parkinson's. How does it make any sense for Congress to risk stopping up to 100 life-saving cures for these diseases just so Democrats can pay for huge green welfare subsidies for the wealthy and big business. In this bill, Democrats dole out five times more in green welfare subsidy than America spends on basic medical research at the National Institutes of Health each year. Where in the world are their priorities? Speaking of outrageous green welfare, this bill allows a near millionaire family to buy a $75,000 Beamer, Jaguar, or Benz luxury electric vehicle, and they're made is forced to send them a $12,500 subsidy from her taxes. This bill also hands out $1,000 checks to buy an electric bike, likely charged by coal and fossil fuel, rather than simply a normal bike that's powered by, say, calories. Why are blue-collar workers, nurses, teachers, and firefighters subsidizing the wealthy and big business with a quarter of a trillion dollars in green welfare check? Aren't there more important priorities like curing cancer, more affordable health care, or safer neighborhoods. And since China dominates the manufacturing of wind turbines, solar panels, and rare earth minerals for batteries, well, you're welcome, China. Speaking of workers, when Main Street businesses are desperate for workers to stay afloat and stop rising prices, how does it make sense for Congress to expand child tax credit checks no longer tied to work? This turns an important incentive created by congressional Republicans into merely a welfare program that discourages Americans from reconnecting with their job, and that hurts everyone. Finally, make no mistake, while it's not in here yet, Democrats are planning to repeal the $10,000 salt cap to give a huge break to millionaires and give them a tax shelter against tax hikes. Today, 80% of Americans oppose these tax hikes on businesses coming out of COVID, and when they learn the Green New Deal really just means a lot of green new subsidies for the wealthy, they'll oppose that as well. Let's use some common sense. Coming out of the pandemic, the last thing Americans need are higher prices, fewer jobs, and the largest expansion of our welfare state in our lifetimes. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Pursuant to notice, we will now turn to consideration of our budget reconciliation legislative recommendations relating to a variety of tax and health measures. This committee print is by far the most far-reaching and voluminous of the recommendations we have considered during this reconciliation process. I am quite certain there will be spirited debate over the next two days that is commensurate with the historic magnitude of what we are about to undertake. Put simply, these are investments that promise to shape the lives of Americans for the better for generations to come. For starters, this proposal will make substantial investments in the development and deployment of clean energy to do our part in fighting the climate crisis while creating good, well-paying jobs across the country. Climate change is one of the most catastrophically dangerous challenges confronting our nation and the world. It's already causing increased wildfires, drought, flooding, and severe storms. If we don't take bold action, these phenomena will only intensify in the coming years as the planet continues to warm. 
Greener energy sources and job creation are just the start of our work to bolster the economy and strengthen communities. The pandemic placed a tremendous strain on cities and states, making it extremely difficult for them to provide the critical services of which residents rely. In April of 2020, I joined the U.S. Conference of Mayors for a roundtable discussion and heard directly from the mayors of Arlington, Texas, Dayton, Ohio, Columbia, South Carolina, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. They all have the same message. We need federal assistance to keep our cities afloat and recover from this crisis. The relief packages Congress passed over the last 18 months provided some crucial aid, but we can do more. The Build America bonds, which I have long championed, and advanced refunding bonds in this proposal will help states pursue public-private partnerships and make new infrastructure investments. As a former mayor myself, I know how impactful these financing tools can be in spurring development and creating more prosperous communities. We also seek to expand proven tax credit initiatives that encourage affordable housing and economic investments in areas that are most in need. Programs like the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, the New Markets Tax Credit, the Historic Tax Credit, and the New Neighborhood Homes Tax Credit are critical to attracting capital to underserved areas, especially for those who have been historically overlooked in communities like our tribes and territories. When combined, the whole of these credits is greater than the sum of their parts. The proposed proposal in front of us ensures that every tax tool we have to benefit our community members and create good jobs will work together more effectively across our entire country. Over the past few months, we've seen a particularly powerful example of how the tax code can be used to benefit people's lives. We expanded the child tax credit in the American Rescue Plan and provided it to families through monthly advance payments that began in July. It has worked. That money allowed folks to keep a roof over their heads, to put food on the table, and to be able to pay for diapers, medicine, school supplies, and other interests that kids need. It lifted millions of children out of poverty and pumped life into the economy as more people could afford to spend money again, hence creating greater demand. Today, we are proposing to extend the expansion through the end of 2025 and make refundability of the credit permanent. The American Rescue Plan also expanded the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Dependent Care Credit, changes that further supported families and again rewarded work. We will consider our plan to make these expansions permanent to provide Americans with greater stability and financial security. Today isn't just about financial health, though. It's also about investing in people's physical health and ensuring they're able to have access to the care they need. Twelve states have not expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, depriving more than two million people of access to health insurance and quality affordable care. My staff alerted me to the following statistic yesterday. 99% of the children in Massachusetts have health insurance. 98% of the children of the adults in Massachusetts have health insurance. More than the high 70 percentiles approve of the care they're receiving. Politicians at state levels are unnecessarily preventing vulnerable individuals from gaining coverage for political reasons. We propose investments to finally close the coverage gap and provide these Americans, 60% of whom are black, Latino, Asian, or Pacific Islander, with meaningful health and economic gains. The American Rescue Plan included an expanded premium tax credit to lower health insurance costs, a change we now seek to make permanent. We will also help people keep more of their hard-earned money in their pockets by reducing prescription drug costs. Americans pay significantly more for their medications than their counterparts in other similar nations. That is simply not fair. Our proposal allows the Health and Human Services Secretary to negotiate lower prescription prices, providing people with tremendous savings. Taken together, these investments will dramatically improve Americans' abilities to support themselves and their families, to stay healthy and access affordable care when they're not, and to leave the planet cleaner, a better place for their children, and indeed their grandchildren. I urge all of my colleagues to wholeheartedly embrace these proposals and the life-changing improvements they offer. The measures we are considering today do a lot of good, but they do it responsibly by raising the revenue needed to provide for the programs we propose. 
We are unafraid to secure revenue when our priorities demand it, and our plan does so in a manner that is sustainable, economically rational, and equitable. The individual income tax increases in this proposal come in the context of several decades of rising income and wealth distortions, as I have noted. And the tax system has not done enough to stop it. Instead, our tax system lost its progressive power at the top end because many of the wealthiest taxpayers in America have had a chance to play by different rules than those of ordinary wage earners. We are taking a significant step toward leveling the playing field. Specifically, we propose to increase the top individual rate to 39.6 and to increase the top capital gains rate to 25 percent and add a 3 percent surtax for individuals making over $5 million. The previous administration had no interest at the beginning in cutting that top individual rate. I know they talked to me about it. It was only the complications created by the SALT tax that made them move in that direction. The 199A deduction will be capped at $500,000 so that it can remain targeted to small business owners that it was originally intended for. In line with President Biden's pledge and our party's values, we have ensured that none of these tax increases will affect households earning under $400,000. Over the past few decades, the average American family has weathered multiple storms of financial crisis and economic uncertainty, while the wealthiest among us have really enjoyed a smooth sailing, and the corporate sector has seen many boom times. This year, a record share of the S&P 500 companies beat their earnings estimates, which is terrific and the market continues to set all-time highs, which is good. We applaud these achievements. But it makes fundamental sense that these large, profitable entities should help pay for the very infrastructure that makes their laudable success indeed possible. And so the committee's proposal will raise the corporate tax rate to 26.5. And by the way, I know the history of that issue as well. Recall that former President Obama was at 28 percent, and the Republicans, by and large, on this committee at the time, we're at 25 percent. That's the reality of it. We found a path at 26.5. That is still considerably lower than the 35 percent tax rate that was in effect in 2017. Of course, the success of America's corporations is due in no small part to their preeminence around the world. Our tax law plays a powerful role in shaping the global economy, and we want to continue promoting that economy and make sure that our company's global competitiveness stands without harmful incentives to move jobs overseas. To that end, I have publicly celebrated Secretary Yellen's success in negotiating the outline of a global minimum tax at the OECD. Remarkable what she did. The international provisions of this subtitle will set a model for the kind of minimum tax that we expect our peer countries to adopt. We propose increasing the guilty rate to meet our exceed or exceed the OEC threshold, rationalize the beat so that it only applies to companies that make base eroding payments to low-tax jurisdictions, and cleaning up aspects of the TCJA that were frustrating for many taxpayers, like the treatment of carry-forward and losses. Finally, we take serious that no matter how well-designed our tax law is, it will mean little if the IRS doesn't have the resources to enforce it. To that end, we propose a long overdue investment in the technology and human capital needed for complex audit audits. No one likes raising taxes, but thanks to the strength of our economy, we can afford to do this. But we cannot afford to skimp on the critical investments throughout this proposal. I urge you all to support these essential and responsible revenue programs. Now let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Brady, for the purposes, again, of offering an opening statement. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you will uh, hear claims today uh, that need to be fact-checked in advance. One, you will hear that this has no impact on America's small business, but that's not true. Raising the individual rate uh, raises the rate on small businesses, most of whom file as individually. Cutting the pass-through uh, small business tax deduction that impacts 30 million small businesses hurts those pass-through businesses as well. Increasing and expanding the investment tax across America to all small businesses 
means they have <coughs> less money to invest in their company, in their workers, and in their growth. And of course, taking the onerous death tax back, back to what it was before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act means that more family-owned farms and businesses will now be forced to sell off their land or sell off their property to Uncle Sam, pay their tax to Uncle Sam rather than pass it on to the next generation. How is it fair that Americans work their entire life to build up a nest egg only to have Uncle Sam swoop in and take uh, nearly half of it uh, over the eligible amount? You'll hear today that, that uh, President Biden doesn't break his pledge on taxing Americans making less than $400,000. But that's false as well. As you know, businesses uh, don't pay taxes, they collect them. And those burdens land on their workers, lands on their customers, lands on the retirees whose retirement depends upon their success, and the lands on the communities that they live in. We saw all of this prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, where it seemed like every week Americans would wake up to read about another U.S. company moving their manufacturing jobs, research, and headquarters overseas, leaving so many communities devastated. Well, two different groups, the liberal, I should say, left-leaning tax policy center, as well as the Joint Committee on Taxation, confirm that it is lower and middle-income families that bear a significant portion of the corporate tax rate their taxes will be felt. And in this bill, a significant amount of revenues raised from tobacco and other taxes, where 90% of that tax falls on Americans making less than 400,000. The Biden tax pledge is simply broken in this bill. And speaking of the president, we ought to probably fact check some of his repeated claims. For example, the one he makes almost every day that where he claims the $2 trillion Republican tax cuts went to corporations and to the wealthy 1%. A fact check by the Washington Post gives that claim for Pinocchios, saying it is misleading and, quote, simply wrong. Not that you won't hear that multiple times a day, but it simply isn't the fact. They said the same uh, of uh, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, saying that uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, claiming it was a middle-class tax hike. Factcheck.org said the center must have had a mistweet. It was so far wrong. Uh, when uh, failed gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams say the Republican tax bill rigged the system against working people, again, factcheck.org called it distorting the facts. In fact, uh, the highest percentage of tax reduction went to those lower and middle income families. And those who benefited the most were people of color, those with low skills, uh, minorities, women, disabled. We lifted millions of Americans out of poverty. We also, factcheck.org also gave uh, uh, South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg another fact check for suggesting the TCJA is responsible for creating the nation's debt problem, and noting that America had two of the largest uh, revenue years in American history following the tax cuts. In fact, it was spending largely responsible for the debt. And of course, Senator Bernie Sanders was fact-checked strongly when he said 83 percent of the benefits went to the top 1 percent. Uh, Factcheck.org simply called it misleading. But that's not the only areas that need fact-checking. If you raise America's tax, corporate tax rate to the highest in the world, jobs will leave America in a big way. And when Secretary Yellen negotiates a global tax agreement that takes our jobs, that takes our tax base, and favors foreign companies and workers over American ones, I guarantee you that is a trade tax agreement Congress will reject. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The committee will now proceed to consideration of the committee print consisting of site titles F, G, H, and J. Without objection, the measure will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. At this time, I offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute which was distributed in advance along with a green sheet explaining it. 
Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read, open for amendment at any point, and considered base text for the purpose of amendment. Let me now turn to Tom Barthold, Chief of Staff to the Joint Committee on Taxation, and Amy Hall, the Staff Director of the Health Subcommittee, to provide the technical description of the amendment in the nature of a substitute with an emphasis on changes made since introduction. I ask that members hold their questions until after their presentation. Mr. Barthold. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the committee members have before them several joint committee documents, JCX 37, 38, 39, 40, uh, which describe the underlying subtitles F, G, H, and J, and uh, JCX 43 and 42, the green sheet describing uh, changes from the Chairman's Amendment, the nature of a substitute, and the staff's overall estimate of the revenue, revenue estimates of the provisions in the bill. Um, I know the members want to proceed to uh, questions and debate, but I'll take just uh, a few minutes to highlight uh, some of the provisions across these titles. Uh, I think it's fair to say that many of the provisions make modifications to existing, uh, existing law with which the members are familiar, so I'll try to highlight some of the, uh, the new provisions. In subtitle F, the uh, infrastructure uh, uh, title, uh, there is a, provided a new credit for government-owned broad, uh, government-owned and operated uh, and maintained uh, broadband facilities. Uh, this is a 30 percent uh, credit that would be paid to the local government. There's also a new cr uh, credit for rehabilitation of owner-occupied housing in low-income, high-poverty uh, neighborhoods. This is an allocated credit based on a state allocation. And then, as noted in the Chairman's Amendment, Nature of Substitute, there's a new credit for uh, employment in the uh, possessions, uh, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. It provides a tax credit for 20% of wages and qualifying fringe benefits, up to $50,000 of those uh, wages and fringe benefits. And in the case of certain uh, defined small employ uh, employers, the credit is increased to 50% of wages up to $139,500. Subtitle G provides uh, a number of uh, incentives related to uh, alternative energy. The uh, production tax credit and investment tax credits of sections 45 and 48 are uh, extended, but the credit rate is now conditioned on uh, meeting certain labor standards and domestic content standards in the uh, construction and operation of those facilities. Uh, section 48, the investment tax credit is expanded to add batteries uh, battery and battery storage facilities uh, as qualifying facilities. An investment tax credit uh, is, uh, it would be enacted for electric transmission property. There's a new tax credit to uh, promote production of sustainable aviation fuel and clean hydrogen uh, and a clean hydrogen fuel production tax credit. Subtitle uh, H, uh, relating to social safety net provisions, uh, as was noted in the opening statement by the uh, chairman, uh, it would extend the child tax credit expansions enacted in the American Recovery Plan uh, Act through 2025, providing for full refundability on a monthly basis. The child and dependent care tax credit would be made fully refundable on a permanent basis. The uh, 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 chairman's amendment also provides for a new payroll tax credit for employers of child care workers. This credit would be for up to 50% of $2,500 uh, paid in wages quarterly. Uh, the provision, uh, the uh, amendment also provides a new tax credit uh, for caregivers of up to 50% a 50% uh, credit on up to $4,000 of qualifying expenses uh, for individuals who help qualifying individuals with activities of daily living and, uh, and care. Um, as the chairman had noted, uh, it would, the uh, amendment would make permanent the uh, it reduced household contributions uh, for health care through the premium tax credit and make some other uh, uh, changes to that provision. Uh, the amendment creates a new public university research infrastructure uh, credit and modifies the tax on endowment uh, income 
implementing a financial aid uh, test. Uh, subtitle I uh, provides that the corporate tax rate would be increased to 26.5%, places new limits on interest deductions, uh, in particular where a multinational enterprise is considered to be over levered in the United, uh, in the United States. With respect to multinational uh, enterprises, the global intangible low taxed income or guilty tax would be modified to do the accounting on a country by country basis rather than a blended worldwide basis, reduces the qualified business asset investment uh, uh, deemed return from 10% to 5%, lowers the overall uh, deduction allowable for qualified income which increases the effective marginal tax rate on the so-called guilty income. Uh, the amendment also modifies the base erosion anti-abuse tax, known as the BEAT tax, uh, uh, changes the treatment of net operating losses and tax credits that the taxpayer may claim on, it, uh, on its regular return. Uh, it eliminates the applicable uh, threshold test, uh, potentially expanding the number of uh, enterprises subject to the tax it would increase the beat tax rate. Also provides that foreign tax credit uh, limitations would be calculated on a country by country basis. With respect to individuals, as the chairman noted, would uh, restore the 39.6% uh, tax rate and lower the entry threshold, increase the rate of tax, maximum rate of tax on capital gains income to 25% and aligns the, uh, the, break uh, the threshold breakpoints with that of ordinary income. Uh, the amendment also expands the net investment income tax to S corporation shareholders, limited partners, and LLC members uh, that are not currently subject to either FICA or SICA taxes on certain distributed share income, uh, distributed shares or income. Uh, this applies to uh, individuals with joint returns in excess of $500,000. An AGI surcharge of 3% on modified adjusted gross income in excess of $5 million uh, would be uh, uh, imposed. The estate and gift tax, which under present law has, uh, 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 has an exemption amount, which is due to, uh, due to be reduced after 2025, it would accelerate that uh, a reduction in the exemption amount. Effective next year, the exemption amount would be approximately $6 million. Uh, $6 million. Uh, and the uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute also doubles uh, current tobacco excise taxes and includes in that tax base uh, nicotine products such as those uh, uh, in e-cigarettes. Uh, e um, that concludes uh, uh, my brief overview of uh, these titles. There's also a penalty excise tax in subtitle J relating to, uh, uh, relating to uh, drug, uh, drug prices. Uh, Ms. Hall will uh, explain the uh, amendment, the nature of substitute uh, for subtitle J, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that the members might, ha uh, uh, might have related to these revenue provisions. Thank you, Mr. Barthol. Why, we, will we will proceed to Ms. Hall, and then we will uh, offer opportunity for members to ask questions. Ms. Hall. Thank you, Chairman Neal. Um, so I'm uh, going to talk about two components of the uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute before us today. Subtitle H includes part six, the pathway to practice training program. Section 137601 establishes section 1899C of the Social Security Act for the rural and underserved pathway to practice training program for post baccalaureate and medical students. Uh, this section incentivizes those from rural and underserved communities to become physicians and to practice in those communities uh, through a scholarship and a stipend for qualifying students to attend medical school or post-baccalaureate and medical school. There are a thousand scholarships per year beginning in 2023. Section 137603 amends section 1886 of the Social Security Act to incentivize additional residency training by increasing physician residency training positions to certain applicable hospitals that are recognized by the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education for committing to train physicians that meet the above requirements. And there would be 1,000 slots per year for these residency positions. 
the amendment in the nature of a substitute makes no changes to these provisions. And finally, subtitle J includes four major parts. Part one is lowering drug prices through fair price negotiation. This part establishes a new fair price negotiation program in Title 11 of the Social Security Act, whereby the Secretary would negotiate fair prices on prescription medications. Part two provides for Medicare Parts B and D prescription drug inflation rebates. This part requires manufacturers to provide a rebate for drugs covered under Parts B and D of the Medicare program that have price increases faster than inflation. This, uh, these rebates take into account commercial sector units and prices. Part three is the Part D improvements and maximum out-of-pocket cap for Medicare beneficiaries, which would provide an out-of-pocket cap on Medicare beneficiary Part D drug spending of $2,000 per year. It would also redesign the Part D benefit to better align incentives in the program. Part four addresses uh, a rebate rule entitled Fraud and Abuse Removal of Safe Harbor Protection for Rebates Involving Prescription Pharmaceuticals and Creating a New Safe Harbor Protection for Certain Point of Sale Reductions in Price on Prescription Pharmaceuticals and Certain Pharmacy Benefit Man Manager Service Fees that was published uh, in November 30th, 2020. The Chairman's uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute does not make any ch changes to subtitle J. That concludes my walkthrough and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hall. We will now begin the opportunity for members to raise questions, and uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we've got a lot of work to do here. It's been interesting as uh, uh, perhaps comparisons have been made to what we're doing here and the gravity and magnitude uh, compared to what we've done in the past and the amount of time uh, granted and so forth. But I'll, I'll reserve more of my comments for uh, later in this process, but I do want to uh, talk to Mr. Barthold uh, about a few technical items. Uh, good to see you, welcome. Uh, starting on page 226, the amendment in the nature of a substitute creates a new fuel credit for sustainable aviation fuel on page 227, the uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute defines what a qualified mixture of sustainable aviation fuel and kerosene is. It says, quote, one, such mixture is produced by the taxpayer in the United States. Along with other requirements, I'm wondering, does that mean that the components going into that mixture must be produced in the U.S. or just the components must be mixed together in the U.S. to qualify? Uh, Mr. S is this my live? Sorry, uh, Mr. S Mr. Smith, uh, it's a mixture credit. It must be mixed in the United States, but uh, components may be produced uh, abroad. Okay, I appreciate that clarification. And so, if this credit is enacted, and you have a company uh, purchase sustainable aviation fuel from Malaysia or Brazil, and they get their kerosene from, say, Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. They could still access this credit as long as they mix the two together in the U.S. Would that be accurate? That's correct, Mr. Smith. So on pages 228 to 229, number two, it says the certification methodology must use the most recent carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation adopted by the International Civil Aviation Organization Agreement with the U.S. I'm told that because this model is somewhere between 10 and 15 years out of date, U.S. grown corn and soy do not qualify. If U.S. grown corn and soy don't meet this model's standards, the sustainable aviation fuel produced from them would be ineligible. Would that be correct? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the particulars about U.S. Uh, corn and soy, Mr. Smith, but if they do not, under the statute, if the components don't meet the standards, they would not qualify. Okay. <clears throat> I would like to ask unanimous consent uh, to include in the record a letter from the Renewable Fuels Association, the Biodiesel Board, the corn and soybean growers, and others expressing the concerns relating to the language currently in the bill. I, I realize that, that there's quite the rush to uh, get a sizable stack of, of text here uh, approved and moved through the process 
uh, to the point where I know there's bipartisan concern about uh, the rush nature of these very technical, very uh, detailed, uh, in-depth uh, so re requirements. And uh, I, I am very concerned that we're headed in the wrong direction. But uh, moving forward here, section 138210, starting on page 659 of the amendment, sets valuation rules for transfers of non-business assets and includes rules for determining passive assets. In my district in Nebraska, a commonly used structure for cattle operations is to have one entity oversee the cattle and operations and have the land held in a separate entity which leases the, cat the land to the cattle operation. Under a structure like that, would the land holding entity receive an exemption as an ag entity and if not, what would be the impact this provision would have on that entity? Uh, Mr. Smith, I'll, I'll have to respond later on that uh, since uh, you're asking about specific uh, uh, tax situations. So I'll ask one of my colleagues to help me review it and I will respond to uh, you and the chairman uh, later, to, uh, later today. Okay, well, I, I appreciate that and, and I think that speaks to my concern uh, about the the detailed nature of this, that we have folks across America very concerned about what, what this language would do uh, to their own operation. And uh, Mr. Bartold, I, I greatly respect your work, your knowledge and insight, and uh, perhaps um, this the language of the bill is not as straightforward as some would claim. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Barthel, thanks so much for being here today. Just a couple questions. Does the JCT's model assume that some of the corporate tax will be borne by workers? Uh, yes, it do, uh, yes, it does, Mr. Kelly. Uh, in the uh, short run, less so. Uh, in the long run, uh, in the long run, more so. Any idea how much? Uh, for our modeling purposes, and we're relying on uh, fairly, I'd say, middle of the uh, middle of the road economic analysis uh, in the immediate short run, uh, we model that uh, a change in the corporate tax rate, for example, is borne by the owners of capital, primarily the owners of, uh, of the corporations. Over a longer, uh, over a longer period, as investments, uh, as investments change, rates of return and opportunities change, uh, literature suggests that 25 percent of the burden of the corporate tax may be borne by uh, labor in terms of uh, diminished uh, wage growth. Again, the, the last twenty-five percent by by who who's going to bear this brunt of this? Uh, uh, labor, labor. Workers. Okay. Uh, so the the higher corporate tax rate in this bill is a four five hundred forty billion dollar tax increase. How much of that five hundred forty billion would apply to individual taxpayers earning under four hundred thousand? Mr. Kelly, I don't uh, have that at my fingertips. Uh, my colleagues are presently working on uh, uh, preparing a, a distribution analysis of the overall bill at the request of a number of uh, members, and we hope to make that available later today. Okay, so it's difficult to tell right now from what, what you have to work with. Is that what you're telling us? At, at what I have here at the table with me in my I notes, I cannot answer your question. Okay, all right, all right. Can, Maybe you can get back to me later about that. Now, can you give us any detail about the numbers of small businesses that will be affected by this bill? Um, well, the, uh, uh, the bill makes changes that affect small businesses in a number of different uh, uh, ways. For example, um, the corporate tax uh, changes, uh, in addition to ha taking the top corporate tax rate to 26.5%, uh, it reimposes a tiered tax, uh, uh, tax structure. Uh, so, for example, for corporations with a, uh, uh, a taxable income of $400,000 or less, there's an 18% tax rate. Uh, in 2018, there was uh, something uh, a little less than uh, one and a half million uh, C corporations that had uh, taxable income under 400,000. The second tier, uh, of taxable income uh, under the uh, new leg proposed legislative structure is for taxable incomes between 400,000 and 5 million. Again, in 2018, there were slightly less than uh, 50,000 uh, corporations in, uh, uh, in that would be, who would fall in that bracket. Okay, so then how many between 400,000 and 5 million do you think? Uh, no, the 400, that, 
uh, that's, uh, that was about 50,000, sir, for 2018. So year in, year out, over the next few years, roughly the same. So then the total number of these corporations, between going from, going from the 400,000 up to the 5 million, the total number? Oh, uh, going from, let's say, from zero to 400,000 is about one and a half million. Most, most C corporations uh, are, are, very, are very small. The bulk of the corporate income tax is paid by, um, you know, uh, in the neighborhood of um, 15 to 20,000 larger enterprises. Okay. How many pass-through owners would be subject to either the 199A limitation or the expansion of the 3.8% uh, Obamacare surtax? The uh, uh, limitation uh, at $500,000 on the deduction under uh, Code Section 199A, uh, we estimate would uh, affect approximately 42,000 uh, uh, taxpayers. The, I do not have uh, an estimate uh, at hand, but I will uh, ask my colleagues to work on one to answer your question related to the net investment income. Okay, that would be helpful because I think at some point uh, we have to realize that these tax increases are impacting a lot more people than we may, than we may be talking about today and thinking, oh, no, no, you don't understand. See, this is not going to affect... Uh, people who make less than 400,000 or corporations. So there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. Uh, it's, I, and I think sometimes the detail is always, uh, as to say, the devil is always in the details. Uh, and, and this is exactly where we are in this because what we say going into something isn't always what it actually ends up being. Now, has JCT ever created a distributional table for the green energy tax credits? Uh, Mr. Kelly, as, as I noted, we're uh, going to try and uh, provide members with a distribution table for the overall uh, bill. The, the uh, subtitle G, the uh, energy title, has um, uh, provisions that are at the individual or household level as well as at the business level. As a general uh, uh, analytical matter, the, uh, the business level taxes reduce uh, either corporate income taxes or business income taxes, and those would uh, those will be part of our distribution of the effect on uh, business tax receipts and the, business, and the burden on business tax. Okay, so, thank you. So uh, the the gentleman, answer. yeah, Tom, I, yes. I appreciate, we're, I've run out of time. Sure. Mr. Chairman, thank you, I appreciate uh, the fact. I, I do wish that we had had more time and had more panels and had discussions way before we drafted all this that would help, I think, almost every member to have a better understanding of where it thank is the, we're going. Thanks, thank the sir. gentleman. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the things that we're missing in a huge way, and that's the world I grew up in, uh, is when you look at, we talk about corporate rates, we talk about individual rates, but pass-through entities and small business don't get the recognition they deserve. Uh, the numbers I'm looking at, 99% of all U.S. businesses are small businesses. They employ over 60 million people. Uh, and when you look at pass-through entities, according to the Brookings Institute, 95% qualify uh, as a pass-through entity. So my question, Mr. Bartow, is, is a couple of things. In terms of raising the rate from 37 to 39.6, that rate alone, uh, they claim it's $170 billion. What percentage falls on pass-through business entities uh, compared to individuals? Because there's people that obviously that work at a job every day and maybe have a great job and they make two million dollars. God bless them. But I'm concerned about the, the, a lot of the small businesses that have 50, 100 employees that this is going to impact. And my number is 170 billion dollars, based on what I've seen, is going to talk is going to raise their taxes. Uh, now I want to know what percentage, if you know, is uh, individuals compared to small business pass through businesses. Uh, Mr. Buchanan, I, I do not have that information available right now. I will uh, ask my colleagues to see if we can make a projection of uh, the number of taxpayers uh, who would be in the 39.6 percent bracket uh, who report uh, income. But um, you understand what I'm saying. Individuals that are employed, there's a lot of people who make a lot of money in different parts of the world. 
but I'm focused on someone that's got 30 to 50 to 100 employees, the impact they're going to have. The second question is on the elimin elimination of the 199 tax, I mean, or that uh, the fact that there's a 20 percent reduction for small business. We seem to get so caught up in all these other taxes, but that's going to be another 70, $78 billion that's going to be uh, thrown on the backs of small business. Isn't that true? Uh, the, Mr. Uh, Buchanan, the, the provision uh, limits the deduction to under $500,000. No, I'm talking about in the past. In the past, we had a 20% 20 per, 20 reduction for small business because I, I had a bill that basically I was trying to get some parity with the corporate world. Small businesses should have the same consideration. You got corporate taxes if you want to take a percentage of 21 or 26 percent. Uh, and you've got pass-through entities, most of them, not, not most of them, some of them at 39.6. So the fact that you're not going to be able to have that deductions for businesses that qualify, that means uh, there's, they're going to lose 6 or 7 percent. And in the business world, they need that, those dollars to be able to grow and expand. That's their gasoline. That's the way they can move forward. So the question is, the numbers I've got, I think it's in the books here, numbers have been put out, $78 billion in terms, of, uh, in terms of going forward is the additional tax uh, that I think is in the documentation. And I just want to have you verify that's the case in terms of eliminating the, the 199A for businesses 500 and above or 400,000 and above, which most of the businesses that have 30 or 40 or 50 employees need to make that minimally. Uh, otherwise, they can't be in business long term. That's just my sense of it. But is that, um, I guess I'm asking you, is that a true statement? They're going to pick up $199, $200 billion in additional tax on the back of small business. Is he on Zoom? Uh, Mr. Buchanan, in regarding the limitation on the deduction under Section 199A, you're referring to on page 7 of the uh, revenue table, JCX 42, uh, under part 2. Item four, the limitation on the deduction, which, as you uh, reported, we've estimated to raise approximately $78 billion uh, over the. Over and then, the uh, Mr. Bartol, let me ask you on the surtax, they're saying $127 billion. What percentage is that is going to land on the backs of small business? That surtax, $127 billion. I will, uh, I will try to uh, respond to you uh, and the chairman. Uh, later with an estimate of the number you, of... You see what I'm trying to do is I'm looking at what it was and what it'll be going forward if this passes. I'm just trying to get a sense of on the backs of businesses, what is this going to cost them? You know, my numbers are $375 billion just for starters, and then you got business losses for another $167 billion. So there's, you know, I don't know, a trillion dollars that's going to be on the back minimally of small pass-through type businesses, some small, some large. I just wanted to get your thoughts. That's, that's where I'm at. Mr. Buchanan, I understand your question, and I'll try and get a response to uh, you and the rest of the uh, committee uh, later today. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Miller, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Democrats have set the cutoff for the EV tax credit at $800,000. What is the income level for the top 1%? Uh, Mrs. Miller, we, we estimate uh, uh, the top per, uh, one percentile uh, is around $625,000 of uh, uh, income as, as we measure it with the expanded income concept, 625000 Okay, thank you. Who would benefit from a change to the SALT cap, and how much does the average middle class taxpayer save if the SALT cap does get increased or repealed? Uh, well, Mrs. Miller, well, first of all, there's, there's no provision in the uh, legislation before us uh, related to the current law limitation on state and local taxes. Uh, a number of different members, uh, I know both on the committee and off the committee, have made uh, different proposals. And so to answer your question, you actually kind of need a specific uh, proposal, total repeal or limitation. Uh, um, be happy to uh, uh, be happy to re 
respond, but need some specifics. Okay, thank you very much. The chair is prepared to proceed to offering members an opportunity to strike the last question. I'm sorry, strike the last word. Oh, okay. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Smucker, is recognized to inquire. Uh, I have questions. Is that, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, do, my question is, uh, do U.S. companies pay uh, state-level corporate taxes in addition to the federal corporate tax? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, they do, Mr. Smucker. And wonder if you could tell us the rate the OECD uses as a combined U.S. federal and state corporate tax rate. Um, you know, we'd like to make uh, apples to apples comparisons across uh, other countries, and and I think it. You would think it would be fair to add both the state and the federal to make that comparison, correct? Uh, the OECD, uh, when they uh, present cross country uh, comparisons. Uh, does add subnational taxes, uh, particularly for uh, the United States, where state taxes are more important. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing. I don't know if you could pull the um, mic a little closer. It might be this part of the room. I'm not sure. Sorry about, sorry about that, Mr. Smucker. Uh, yes, the OECD does uh, uh, include uh, state, U.S. state-level taxes when they make some cross-country comparisons. Uh, in recent uh, uh, publication, the OECD measured uh, the U.S. corporate tax rate, including the average state tax burden, uh, to uh, be an effective rate of 25.75 percent. I'm sorry, so it's 25.75 percent? 25 and three quarters percent. 25 and three quarters percent for uh, total federal and state. What, what is the corporate yes, tax rate in China? Uh, the stated tax rate in China is uh, uh, 25 percent. 25 percent? Yes, sir, 25 percent. So the effective rate uh, already in the United States is higher than a company in China? By the, uh, uh, by the OECD's measures, yes, sir. Yeah. Do companies in China ever pay less than 25 percent? Um, I understand that China does have uh, uh, certain special deductions, particularly for the technology sector. So, for example, for their defined technology uh, sectors, the 25% uh, corporate tax rate uh, is reduced to 15%. And uh, again, under uh, certain determinations, uh, I guess it's uh, software sectors, the tax rate may be 10%. So, so the rate, the corporate tax rate in China could be as low as 10% in those situations? Uh, I understand for uh, software development, for generally for technology, 15 percent. Okay. Uh, and what, what is the capital gains rate in China? Uh, I, the in, on individuals, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, I, okay, I do, not, uh, do not know. I will see if uh, one of my colleagues can find out and I will uh, respond to you and the rest of the committee later today. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in uh, having it. The U.S. already has a global minimum tax called uh, guilty, uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware. Does uh, China impose a global minimum tax on their companies? Uh, I do not believe that uh, uh, China uh, imposes a global minimum tax. Uh, are you aware of uh, any other countries that have a uh, guilty type global minimum tax? Uh, not at present, sir. I'm sorry? Not at, not at the present time, sir. No other uh, country has a guilty tax similar to what the U.S. has? That's correct, sir. All right. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't want to inquire like the last word. Would the gentleman turn on his mic? Mr. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, I was referring to, I'm not interested in inquiring. I would like to speak on the last word when that is appropriate. Can you hear me, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman. Please. Okay. Uh, I wanted to speak on the last word, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, we're going to we're problem. just doing the general questions now, uh, Mr. Evans. So if you can ask a good question here, and then we're going to move to the, the strike the last word very shortly. Okay, I wait to the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, question, Ms. Barthol. What's the uh, maximum EV tax credit available under current law? Um, Seven uh, seven thousand seven thousand five hundred dollars. All right. Uh, and what's it uh, going to be? Uh, what's the new number under under the uh, majority's plan? Uh, the maximum uh, amount under the uh, chairman's amendment, in the nature of a substitute, uh, would be twelve thousand five hundred uh, dollars. Actually, in both cases, under present law and under the uh, proposal, it depends upon. Uh, battery capacity and a number of different factors. It's not one flat number for all possible electric vehicles. So will all, so will, will all of the electric vehicles, um, will they have the, will they all be eligible for the exact same tax credit? Uh, no, that was, uh, uh, no, Mr. Ferguson, that was the point I was just trying to make. The, the maximum credit amount is 12,500. But that depends upon the battery capacity of the vehicle under the proposal. It depends upon the assembly location, uh, certain labor status, yeah. domestic content, and then there's limitations on the manufacturer's suggested all right, retail all right. price. So, so, so let's talk about that real quick. Um, so you said battery capacity. Uh, in simple terms, the bigger battery you get, the more credit you get? Uh, the f further you can go with the bigger battery, yes, the more credit. All right, so, well, is it the further you can go or the bigger battery? Uh, well, you need the bigger battery to go further. Well, not necessarily. What if you build a more efficient car that uses less raw materials that we have to buy from China and you use a smaller battery that can go further? Uh, then, 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 then it's, would, it's rated would, by, primarily by the battery capacity as an indication okay. of the, the power. All right, so, so, the, so the more stuff we buy from China to build batteries with, the more tax credit they get. With, there's also under this proposal a, uh, a bonus for domestic content. Okay, all right. So, so if any electric vehicle is made in the U.S. anywhere in the U.S., do they get the same, the same tax credit? It, there's a difference between assembly uh, in the U.S. and the domestic content of the components. So, no, they would not necessarily get the same credit. Well. All right. So you said, you said if we if we build it in America, we get the tax credit. But if you build a car in China or Japan or South Korea, you don't get the tax credit, right? Uh, gen generally speaking, uh, in the long term, yes, sir. <clears throat> so, so what's the difference with the with the U.S. manufacturing and the location? Would would a would 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 a, a car that was built in my congressional district or, say, my colleagues from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, in her congressional district um, in Georgia and Alabama, would that get the same treatment as one built in, say, California or Ohio? Whether it was built in Georgia, Alabama, uh, uh, whether it was assembled in Georgia, Alabama, California would not would not matter. They would get the same treatment. The extra so, point so, so that, you were, a, that you were so, so, I I, you were so, so explain to me. Was. Explain to me why, what the difference is. Why would you? Why, why is there? You, you talked about location and assembly and where it was assembled. What, what, what's, what's driving that decision? What's the difference there? What, what yeah. potentially could be the difference between a tax credit for cars built by my fellow Georgians at the Kia plant in West Point, Georgia, um, versus? Folks that build a plant, say in um, in Ohio, outside of Cleveland. Okay. Under present law and under the proposal, you can import a an electric vehicle that was made overseas, and it can qualify for credit. Under the proposal, the credit will be bigger if the vehicle was assembled in the United States, and okay. it will be right, bigger so, but, but yet it if it's assembled with a certain amount of domestic content. All right. Okay. But there's no difference. But, but you said something about labor. What's that? Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, we're supposed to, there's a uh, collective bargaining uh, status of workers, a prevailing uh, uh, wage standard. 
it also okay. qualifies. Okay, hang, hang on a second. So you're saying you're saying that a union worker in Ohio would that plant would be able to get the 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 vehicle built there would be eligible for the tax credit, but the worker that is assembling the plants, assembling vehicles in South Carolina, uh, Georgia, and Alabama that don't have a collective bargaining agreement would not be eligible for those tax credits. The amount of tax credit varies if the different standards are met. Well, I'd say yay or nay. If you're union, you get it. If you're, if you're not union, you don't get it. Is that fair enough? Well, that's a little bit of an o oversimplification. Is a well, different we just level. Like, we like to keep credit. things simple. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barthold, uh, under the text of the bill, small corporations with uh, revenue under four hundred thousand would actually receive a tax cut. Is that correct? Uh, it, uh, the uh, thresholds on taxable income, not on on revenue, but there's an 18 percent bracket on taxable incomes up to four hundred thousand dollars. Under present law, there's a uniform 21 uh, percent tax rate on all corporate income. So under the bill, it cuts that yeah, rate that from is, 21 to 18. Yes. Yeah. And for uh, businesses right. with income between four hundred thousand and five million, the rate would stay at 21 percent? That, that's correct, sir. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Hall about the implementation or the, uh, the $2,000 uh, cap on out-of-pocket cost for seniors. Can you explain how that adjustment uh, works under this legislation from current law and the, the current rate is $3,600 out of pocket, so this would be a reduction to seniors of out of pocket uh, cost of up to $1,600. Is that correct? Yep, you, that's, uh, that's correct. You've answered your own question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I yield back. Let me recognize. The gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Baldholt, last week we heard that the, um, the retirement mandate excise tax would, not a, uh, would exclude people making less than $400,000. Do the proposed tobacco and nicotine taxes exclude people making less than $400,000? The, uh, the taxes are imposed at the manufacturer uh, level, and there's no provision to exclude a purchaser uh, based on uh, who purchases the final product based on income. So there would be a tax increase if somebody the, used tobacco. Uh, the anticipation is that the price of a pack of cigarettes uh, or vaping products will increase. Yes, sir. Has JCT developed a distribution analysis of the tobacco and nicotine provisions to determine how that? would impact uh, different income levels? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, we have, and I can provide that to the committee later this afternoon. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, do, you, do you happen to know off the top of your head how much of that would fall on income for households uh, that would income are under 400,000? Uh, well, I think I do have some information about uh, uh, the present law excise taxes on Tobacco, which would be about the uh, uh, about the same, and uh, we kind of project that there's uh, roughly a good 12 plus million smokers, and most of uh, most of them have incomes uh, under two hundred thousand dollars, like like well over eighty percent. So most of that tax would fall under folks under under present law. Yes. Yeah. So, well, I'd, I'd like to see the distribution when you get a we'll, chance. We I'll will uh, we'll provide that to the uh, to the entire committee later later today, sir. And per particularly concerned with the the median income being less than seventy thousand and the impact that'll have on folks. Um, has has the JCT developed a distribution analysis for reviving the Superfund excise tax? Uh, the Superfund uh, excise taxes uh, uh, 
or a tax on inputs in, uh, in other products generally increases the cost of uh, uh, a large number of products uh, used by uh, a large number of consumers. And so our analysis of the incidence is that the tax is borne by consumers through higher purchase prices of these, uh, of these products. So the short answer to your question is, is yes. Uh, the longer answer is that uh, our distribution would show the effect of the tax uh, distributed pretty much as consumption uh, occurs across uh, tax filing units. And that will be part of the uh, uh, distribution analysis that I had uh, uh, mentioned, I think, to uh, Mr. Kelly that we would be providing later today. And, and doesn't, doesn't the burden of that tax also fall on the middle income households? Uh, uh, again, uh, as general consumers, yes. It's a tax that affects the prices of goods for general consumers, so yes. And particularly since that's a, a bigger percentage of their disposable income has to go to those, those required consumer goods as opposed to having additional disposable income? Uh, that's generally the case, Mr. Estes. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The chair is now prepared to proceed to offering members an opportunity to Chairman, strike the last Mr. word. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Tom Rice. Rice. Mr. Mr. Rice. Rice, are you still on yeah. request to inquire, Mr. Rice? Yes, sir. Okay. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized to inquire. Mr. Barthold, a minute ago you mentioned that uh, in a discussion with Mr. Richmond that uh, corporations that earned under 400000 would get a tax right. cut. Corporations that earned between four hundred and five million and $5 would stay the same, I think is what you said, and then over that there would be a tax increase. Are most corporations organized as C-Corps or pass-throughs? Uh, Mr. Rice, most... Uh, um, uh, there are more business entities uh, uh, in the United States that operate as uh, pass-through uh, entities. This can be S-corporations, uh, limited partnerships, LLCs, and also there's uh, a large, large number of uh, people who operate as sole proprietors. Uh, so so that if it's a pass-through entity, whether it's a corporation or otherwise, are they going to get a tax cut under this proposal? There's no, uh, under, under the bill, there's no direct reduction on uh, taxes on business income. So if they are under 400000 you're not going to get a tax cut, correct? Uh, not related to their business income. There are provisions that reduce taxes. And if they taxes. earn a million dollars, which, you know, let's say that they're employing a hundred Americans and, and they're in the steel wire business and they're in a trade across the world competing with people who pay a whole lot tax, more taxes. If they earn a million dollars in a pass-through entity, is there, are their taxes going to go up or down under this proposal? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rice. I don't know if the connection was not, I'm, I'm not hearing you very, very well. I'm okay. So I'm hoping it's not only company, me, but I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, uh, yes, go, uh, I'm, I'm trying. Go ahead. Okay. If, you have, if you have a company that, a pass-through, that, that employs 200 Americans and their business is making uh, uh, steel wire and or whatever their business is, and they're competing with companies from around the world paying a whole lot less taxes, and let's say they're, net income is a million dollars. Are their taxes going to go up or down under this proposal? Uh, this was a pass-through entity, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. The, the limitation, uh, as we discussed earlier, under section, uh, Code Section 199A is limited to a, uh, a 500... Uh, income of five hundred thousand dollars for a deduction so under the under the facts as you cited them uh they would not be able to take uh, the advantage of 199a that they can under present uh under present law so they would likely have a higher tax bill 
So, so their tax would go up under that by 20%. Yes, yes sir, under the uh, example that you created. And, and then the surtax, uh, the HI tax, the 3.8%, would that not apply to them as well? The, uh, sur um, uh, the surtax, the 3% uh, on uh, AGI applies above $5 million of individual uh, income. So it depend, uh, in, your, uh, in your example, it would depend how the business is, uh, uh, is owned, uh, what sort of total income uh, uh, is reported. Uh, yes, sir. I, I, I said that wrong. I said that I meant to say the expansion of the net in investment income tax. Oh, the net, uh, the net invest. Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah. Then if, if that, they are, that would if, apply to them as well. That would it, apply to them as well. It, it could apply to them as well, uh, uh, as well, sir. Yes. So their taxes could go up by 25, 30 percent under this proposal, if I'm correct. Uh, I I can't verify your calculation, but uh, yes, uh, in that example, that uh, the owners of that business would have a higher tax liability. Thank you, sir. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bartold, I just have a um, specific um, clarification for you. Um, in the section that deals with the credit given to the possessions, um, the discussion in the description <laughs> of the chairman's amendment in the nature of a substitute um, from your committee, the Joint Committee on Taxation, in your introduction at the bottom paragraph, you um, give an amount there. Can you tell me what is the maximum Social Security amount? Uh, for this year, it is uh, $142,800 is the Social Security earnings maximum. Because I see here you have $139,500. Uh, th that's uh, correct, Ms. Plaskett. And what is that amount related to? What is that amount, the one thirty nine? dollars The uh, $139,500 is the uh, amount that is uh, written as the qualifying maximum for wages uh, eligible for the 50% credit to small employers under the uh, amendment and uh, in that, nature that of substitute. And that amount is tied to the 139,000. It's a, it's a in the in the statutory language before you in the amendment. It's a specific dollar amount. And um, I believe that the discussion was for it to be tied to Social Security maximum, and would that amount be 142? which is a changing amount, correct? The, when, uh, uh, when we uh, spoke privately about possible uh, options uh, at the staff level and, uh, uh, and with you, Ms. Plaskett, uh, we talked about the Social Security maximum. Uh, in the statutory language, it uh, was written uh, by mistake as 139,500. Uh, and uh, I am solely responsible for uh, that error. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and I just want to thank you for all of your assistance and um, your staff's continual work on these really complex matters. It's much appreciated. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield um, to Mr. Ferguson. The gentleman is yielded to Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to a gentleman from Arizona. Mr. Barthold, I want to go back to the discussion we were having earlier on, um, on the EV tax credit. But before we do, I, you said something pretty remarkable, that 80% of the taxes paid on the increase for on the excise tax for tobacco tax would be paid by people making under $200,000 a year. Is that the, is that the, did I hear that correctly? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Okay, and 80, was it 80 percent? Is that what you said? Uh, y yes, sir. Okay, 80 percent making under 200,000. All right, so now l let me go back. If someone that is making $750,000 a year goes out and buys an $80,000 vehicle, I'll pick one, uh, a new Audi, new Lexus, and those are fine cars, maybe, you know, n nothing against them. 
but you got somebody making seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. It's a that assuming they get the maximum credit because they bought the one with the big battery in it, they're going to get twelve thousand five hundred dollars in tax credits. That that's uh, that's possible under the legislation, sir. Yes. Okay. So we got folks at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year getting a twelve thousand five hundred dollar tax credit, and folks making near the bottom third or the bottom quartile of the of the income range are paying more in taxes because of the excise tax on tobacco. Uh, tobacco excise taxes uh, will go up and will be paid by people across all income levels, including uh, the lower. But eighty percent of it. That's correct. Those sir. below. So we got we got those on the lower income side paying higher taxes, and those at the upper income eligible for an for a doubling of the EV tax credit, essentially at twelve thousand five hundred dollars. So we got we got folks that are making less paying more in taxes, and folks that are that are making a lot are getting a tax break. Now, <clears throat> I, I I listened to something that um, my colleague and chairman. Uh, Mr. Neal said, he said, wealthy individuals get to play under different rules. And I would say, based off of what, you've, what you have just affirmed, I, I would say under, under the majority plan, I believe that would be correct. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Mr. Chairman, reclaim. He's yielded his time back to Mr. Schweiker, who still has two minutes and 20 seconds. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barthel, I, I just I want to make, make sure and do this really quick, because I have a fixation that um, we subsidize the rich, and if the left actually needs revenues, um, we, maybe we could cut spending on the rich. But um, So right now we have a potential, you know, if it's union made with the right battery, those things, $12,500 in um, a, a credit for purchasing an electric vehicle. Um, is there also a credit for solar panels? Yes, sir. Is there also a credit for battery walls? Our battery storage. Yes, yes, sir. Residential battery storage. What other um, credits um, are also in there for for, a, in, in, for individuals? For in, uh, for um, uh, high efficiency uh, heating and uh, cooling systems. <clears throat> so if I buy a high sear um, heating cooling system. Yes, yes, sir. And the income threshold. So if I make eight hundred thousand dollars a year in a AGI, adjust gross income. Do I get these credits? Uh, there's, no in, there's no specific income limitation uh, uh, on the residential energy credits. Okay, if I make a couple million dollars a year and I go out and buy an electric bicycle, do I get a credit? Uh, the income limitation actually only applies to um, uh, 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 re regular automobiles. So, so, so uh, for the bicycle, you could claim the credit, sir. So, so it doesn't matter. I could be getting a, making a billion dollars a year, and I'd still get a credit for buying electric vehicle, or excuse me, bicycle. Um, uh, Ms. Rahul, in our last 30 seconds or 28 seconds, um, what's the mean income in the United States? Uh, uh, AGI. Uh, household uh, median, median or mean? Mean. Let's go mean. Uh, I'll have to. The median is is around seventy uh, uh, thousand dollars. I'll have. I'll check and get you the specific number. So, so once again, um, uh, in this more commentary in the last couple of seconds, I mean, the Democrats' bill here functionally is subsidizing the rich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The chair is now prepared to move to the phase of striking the last question. I will begin by recognizing the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, building Back Better begins with health, the health of our neighbors, the health of our planet, and the health of our economy. Just over a decade after the landmark passage of the Affordable Care Act, this week we will be approving legislation to fulfill its promise of health security for millions of Americans. Due, the, due to the obstruction of a few Republican state leaders more concerned with their political health than the health of our neighbors, two million Texans, six million Americans in all, have been left unprotected in states that refuse to expand Medicaid. In Texas, we have the disgraceful distinction of the most uninsured citizens, the most uninsured children in the entire country. 
I have personally seen the, the, the faces of disbelief of poor citizens who cannot secure coverage because they are too poor when their more prosperous neighbors receive substantial health insurance tax credit. It's not right, and we are remitting that with this legislation. Closing the Medicaid coverage gap is essential to assuring health equity. Over half of the gap in Texas is composed of Latino families who borne the greatest burden during the pandemic. Long-standing inequities were exacerbated by this deadly virus, leading to a three-year drop in the life expectancy for Latinos, the greatest gr drop of any group. In calling for a permanent coverage gap solution, Unidos U.S., the largest Latino civil rights advocacy group, noted the disproportionate adverse effect of the pandemic on Latinos, many of whom are essential workers keeping the economy afloat, has made it imperative that equity is at the center of any additional federal investments in our health care system. To pay for this and other health care improvements, this bill makes modest reforms aimed at pharmaceutical price gouging. While this bill's narrow negotiation provisions already exclude too many drugs, too many people, and too much price gouging, there are some who want to make it even weaker. Every step to further weaken negotiation means consumers will continue to pay too much and we will have too little in taxpayer savings to reinvest in these vital health care improvements. Our individual health is already being impacted by the climate crisis, with each week bringing new evidence that we really are in a code red situation when it comes to our overheated planet. Our Green Act provisions combined with work by other committees offer incentives for renewables and electric transportation, such as the electric charger provision that I authored. The health of our economy also depends on correcting the inequities and false promises of the Trump tax law. This begins by paying for our initiatives rather than reverting to the Republican borrow and spend approach, which dug us almost $2 trillion in debt for their tax law and even more for spending necessary to respond to Trump's irresponsible actions that only accelerated the pandemic. As we move forward, however, we, much, we need much more uh, to support President Biden and Secretary Yellen in correcting longstanding abuses by multinationals. American multinationals enjoy an effective tax rate, the tax rate that they are actually paying of just 7.8%. Teachers, firefighters, small business owners would certainly be delighted to have that kind of special treatment. This bill uh, that we consider today provides President Biden less than half of the revenue he sought from international tax reform. But even more important than the dollar figure, so long as our tax laws continue to provide an incentive for multinationals to outsource American jobs and profits to other countries, our economy will be the less. That's why my no tax breaks for outsourcing bill co-sponsored by a majority of the Democratic caucus is designed to stop, but today only some of its provisions are included. It's not fair to Main Street businesses that their giant international competitors enjoy special tax advantages, nor is it fair to American workers to give American corporations a tax break for relocating factories uh, overseas. We should shut the door fully to stop tax incentives for shifting American jobs overseas by reducing the giant gap between the tax rate encouraging an overseas investment and the higher rate for investment here at home. So we have great progress this week, but more work ahead in order to truly build back better for all Americans. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to focus back on pass-throughs, 95% of businesses that are organized, according to the Brookings Institute, 95 are pass-through entities. So pass, uh, tax policy matters. Florida was ranked by the Tax Foundation as a state with the most competitive individual tax system in the country and the sixth most competitive corporate tax code. Florida's economy has grown nearly 50% in the last decade to more than a trillion dollars and the numbers of small businesses in the state has grown by 35 percent over the same time frame. And that's why it's so critical we get this right, in my opinion. I want to, when we talk about pass-throughs, I want to make sure that people are clear 
about what's going, my sense of what's going on. The tax rate, 39.6, you could argue will be less, but there's millions of businesses in this category that'll be impacted by that because you just need to get over four or 500,000 uh, in terms of earnings and then that tax starts. And what does that entity look like? That entity's 30, maybe 50 employees that might make six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars So you're looking at 39.6 for that tax that passes through to them, their individual tax return. The ACA, another 3.8. If they're, and I, I'm first to admit, there's probably not a lot of business, but there's tens of thousands of businesses that'll also be looking at the surtax of 3%. So that takes it to 46.4%. And the corporate rate, originally at 21, might go to 26. Now, you don't think about it, but you need to think about it. When you take into account taxes in terms of state and local taxes, Mr. Chairman, in your state, it's 51.4 percent when you add it all up. For a business, maybe it's got 100 employees, it's going to be impacted that level. California, 59 percent. New Jersey, 57.4. New York, uh, 61.2. And they're concerned about the salt tax. Some of the members says, look, if we don't get that done, we're not going to get it done. That's the least of their worries. Businesses, I'm telling you, are smart. They're going to look at that, and guess what? They're going to Texas. They're going to my mine, I think, to Nevada. They're going to Florida. And that's what's happening. That transfer of, of some of the best and brightest, most capable entrepreneurs, they're leaving because they are not going to pay 60% or 50%. So what does that mean? The business happens to make a million, you employ 75 people in your community, up to half or 40 some percent is gonna to go to taxes. The owner might take out 200. The other three or 400 that's left is the, the money to help grow and expand. But again, they could take up in, in these formulas 50, 60%. And that's why I say that it's so critical that we get this right, especially as it relates to pass-throughs. To take the 20% off the table, I, I just can't even believe we're considering that as something that's critical to pass-throughs. Why would you want the tax rate all in, 50% plus, and you got corporate and other at 26%? And I think it should be, I think it was fair at 21. But the, my point is, look at the difference. Now, and I, a lot of people get confused. You just think of the individual. Set the individual aside for a minute. I'm thinking of the the pass-through, the business entity that's got 100 employees. Not, now, someone that might have five or six, maybe that wouldn't impact them. But someone that's got 150 to 100 employees, this all impacts them, and they're looking at 50% plus rates. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last Gentleman's word. Gentleman's recognized. The legislation before us is a once-in-a-generation investment. It's an investment in our children, our planet, and our future. And it's an investment in the fundamental fairness of our economy, an investment in opportunity for all. I'm particularly proud and grateful that this legislation includes the Green Act, legislation I'm honored to lead, a massive invest investment in clean and renewable energy technologies that represent one of the most aggressive and forward-thinking climate policies ever advanced by Congress. I want to thank my colleagues who contributed uh, to this section of our bill. As I said last week, we've got a third of our country on fire, a third underwater, and a third with no water at all. My Democratic colleagues and I have been sounding the alarm for years, and action is long, long overdue. Our planet cannot afford for us to wait any longer. We need to decarbonize our economy. We need to take advantage of innovative new technologies, and we need to accelerate our economic embrace of solar, wind, geothermal, and other renewable energy sources. That's what the Green Act does. And the best part is we can do all of this while boosting American economic security and competitiveness. Time and again, we're told that Reducing our reliance on fossil fuels is unaffordable or it's bad for our economy. But nothing could be further from the truth. By investing in key technologies and renewable industries today, we can meet the necessary climate benchmarks and create thousands of good paying jobs. It's a win for the planet, a win for workers, and a win for our economy. 
I'm also pleased that this legislation includes several bipartisan priorities of mine. The bill provides new assistance to blind and vision impaired Americans, a bipartisan bill that I've worked on with my colleague, Mr. Kelly from Pennsylvania, by helping them purchase new technologies, enabling these individuals to live and work more independently. It also includes tax incentives for disaster resiliency, encouraging individuals in fire, hurricane, or other disaster-prone regions to participate in resiliency programs that, uh, while, that while ensuring that resiliency investments don't inadvertently trigger a big tax bill. And the package cracks down on bad actors who abuse the conservation easement program one of the best tools at our disposal for the conservation of land, while saving taxpayers billions of dollars. Another bipartisan bill with uh, Mr. Kelly that uh, I've worked on for years. And I'd like to end on this point. This package is paid for. Four years ago, our Republican colleagues rammed through a $2.3 trillion unpaid for tax cut. We were told those cuts would pay for themselves and trickle down to the working class, but that hasn't happened. The cuts haven't paid for themselves, the benefits have overwhelmingly accrued to the wealthy, and we have over $2 trillion more of debt to show for it. Democrats aren't doing that. We're paying for this. The package is fully and sensibly paid for by ensuring that everyone pays their fair share and that the tax code works for all Americans. This is an excellent package, and I look forward to supporting it today and on the House floor. And I yield back the Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, listening to some of these arguments, uh, especially the one that I just heard from my, my colleague from California, uh, claiming that, uh, making it sound like we had less revenue after we passed TCJA than, than before. We actually had more revenue because we contributed to a growing economy and growing opportunity for the American people. Uh, based on uh, what was just said about uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I would like to submit for the record a, a list of false tax reform claims uh, by uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi and others uh, with, with fact-checking uh, uh, along the way. I'd like to submit this for the so record. So ordered. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know it was mentioned uh, earlier that no one ever likes raising taxes. I simply disagree. Uh, the eagerness that I have observed of folks wanting to raise taxes, uh, it, it's very clear. And uh, whether it's the press release announcing this very meeting we are gathering in right now, uh, or whether it's uh, various other announcements made along the way, uh, I, I think we are um, facing some very crucial issues across our country, primarily among them the fact that there are so many job vacancies across America. Let me repeat that. There are so many job vacancies across America that it's actually contributing to inflation. It's con the, those vacancies and that disruption in our supply chains are hurting folks who can't afford it. And when we see inflation, that the tax on the lower class, let, let's face it, low income. Uh, folks uh, on lower incomes are facing higher prices. That is a significant, significant tax. I'd like to focus a little more in depth on subtitles H and I and how uh, they double down on what I would consider failed policies of the past when we should be refocusing on policies which have been proven to grow our economy and get Americans uh, back to work. None of our concerns about the majority's child tax credit expansion have changed since they enacted it just a few months ago. It still diverts IRS resources to sending monthly benefit checks when the agency has a massive backlog. I hear from constituents all the time about this backlog, and the IRS is failing to meet the customer service needs of taxpayers, and we hear about that on the committee I'm from both sides right now and have for some time. But we have... Uh, Issues pending, like I said, that it's as though they don't exist when you read the text uh, of what my colleagues are wanting to push right now. Uh, I think about 
the, the subsidies of electric bicycles and very expensive electric vehicles. Um, and it's already been said multiple times that these subsidies end up going to very wealthy Americans, very wealthy Americans. Uh, I would think we could at least phase that out on, on an income basis. Uh, it, it's interesting that that has not uh, been proposed yet. But I, I would like to offer the reminder that our Tax Cuts and Jobs Act maximized revenue, maximized growth, and ensured fairness in our tax code. Tax revenue has increased every year since we enacted TCJA, every year. Under, TT, under TCJA, the top 1% earners pay more than 40% of all income taxes. The top 10% pays more than 70%. Economic growth was at 3% even after several years of a strong economy. Wage growth has been strongest for lower and middle income Americans under TCJA. That's not what we've seen lately, especially given the policies coming out of Washington over the last few months. There have been zero corporate inversions since TCJA was signed into law. Even President Obama acknowledged that we need to be competitive with our corporate tax code, not defer our, tax, our corporate tax rate to other countries who say they'll raise their, their tax rate. I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll wait to pass judgment on that until it actually happens. But now the majority's proposals to raise our corporate tax rate higher than China's, expand base erosion provisions to punitive levels and tax foreign profits in a way no other major economy does, these all threaten to undermine our successes. This bill is clearly the wrong piece of legislation at the wrong time. This is exact, exactly the opposite thing we should be doing to get our economy back on track and create more freedom, more opportunity for everyone in America. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Larson, do you wish to be recognized? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I Mr. seek Mr. to Larson, strike Mr. Larson, you're recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last uh, word. Uh, Democrats have uh, put forward in the bill, we are marking up today the most consequential tax cuts since the New Deal. That's why, as uh, Mr. Blumenauer noted the other day, we hear echoes coming from the other side of how this is socialism and radical left-wing thinking that's coming out of the Democrats, surely the end of the world as we know it. Uh, and uh, it's astonishing because what this represents is a tale of two tax cuts. Tax cuts where 83% of the cut went to the nation's wealthiest 1%, while the middle class, the working class, were supposed to wait based on the benevolence of these wealthy individuals for money to trickle down to them. Well, that's an approach, an approach that was close to, as The Hill reported in uh, 2017, of $5 trillion. And ultimately, after the trade-offs, which aren't addressed uh, and not being paid for, passing on $2.7 trillion unpaid for. Now, our colleagues on the other side are rightfully concerned about making sure that we don't go further into debt, but have amnesia when it comes to the mountain of debt that they placed on the American people. Uh, and now seem outraged by the fact that spending money now directed to the middle and working classes is an abomination that instead, you know, people should be content to let the rich get rich and the poor continue to bear the burden and see this gap grow. I'm proud of the work that this staff has done in putting together proposals that seek to balance and trust the middle 
and working class people of this nation, when they receive their resources, funny thing, they won't be buying back stock options. No, they'll be buying the basic essentials of life. They will buy food, pay for utilities, educate their children, pay for health care. Uh, and despite the labeling on the other side, as Mr. Pasquale said, if that means providing the opportunities for working families to be able to do this, then call me a socialist. Because these are what peop these are the things that people need to survive. Just like they needed Social Security, just like they needed Medicare, just like they needed the Affordable Health Care Act, where a young man just stood up in a town hall that I had back in East Hartford and said, thank you so much, my premiums were $1,400. Now they're 200, and with that money, I'm going to be able to send my kids to college where previously, because of the slash and burn nature of the other side and trying to end what they affectionately call Obamacare, now people with their families are able to buy health insurance that they can afford and be able to put their savings into the work and benefit of making sure that their kids get a, a better education. I am uh, proud of the ways and means that it included the extension of the monthly child tax credit sponsored by Rosa DeLauro and our own Susan Del Benny on the committee. The authority for the federal government to reduce prescription drug prices, historic investments in green energy, permanent extension of the enhanced tax credits, policies to help state and local governments lower their costs of their borrowing. These are things we all can be proud of. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Do you wish to be recognized? I do, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, just some slight uh, picture to bring to, to light here because I think it's, uh, it's interesting. You're, also, you're recognized to strike the last okay, word. Okay, thank you. I'm striking the last word. And to my self-proclaimed socialist on the other side, uh, thank you. Thank you for making your role clear to all of us. I, I just think that, you know, I've told you before, I'm a, I have 10 grandchildren, and one of the ways you teach kids about morals and, and the way they should live their life is you give, tell them fables. In this case, I brought a picture. This is the goose that lays the golden eggs. And this is a wonderful story to tell children because it tells them, you know, you have to be morally responsible for what it is that you long for. And, and they, sometimes you can get too greedy. And the story of the, the goose that lays the golden eggs, the farmer's really happy when he gets his first egg, but then he and his wife get together and say, you know what? I bet if we got this, this goose, we'll be able to get all the eggs at once. This goose represents hard-working American taxpayers. We continue down this road that's saying, hey, don't worry, because what we're doing to you is really good for you. We will make you uncompetitive. We will make you the laughingstock of the global economy and say, you know what, this is great. America has taken itself out of the race. How wonderful they are. They're just so giving. There's something about returning to our childhood and remembering the very basics of what we were told from the time we were little, don't exceed don't hold your breath. <laughs> what you're able to afford. And it's not how much you make, it's how much you save. In this case, we are going down a road that we cannot come back, and I think it's wonderful that we have all these ideas that we're going to help everybody and we're going to do everything for everybody because this goose is just going to keep laying golden eggs. We are coming to the end of the goose life. We, com we compete in a global economy, yet we think that somehow nobody else in the world is watching us. Nobody else is thinking, let America go. She will self-destruct on her own. So this legislation is going to continue to gut the goose that lays the golden eggs. And we can all be happy because we'll have those golden eggs in front of us. But then next day, when the goose is no longer there, we're going to say, what did we do? How could we have been so foolish? How could we have been so careless and reckless? How could we have continued to do this, but do it in the fact 
that we're doing the right thing for the right people right now. But not going forward. This is a horrible, horrible piece of legislation. And thank you so much for the 1,200 pages or 1,100 pages we got yesterday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, I told my friends, this would be great light reading at night. The only problem is you're going to have nightmares until the next morning. So having said all that, I would encourage all members to take a look at this poor goose as she looks at what she's laid and also understand that this is the last, this is the last time she'll lay those golden eggs because we're going to gut her. That is the hardworking American taxpayer, and we are damn foolish to sit here today and think that somehow this ends well. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Blumenauer, you wish to be recognized? I would, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized to strike the last word. I strike the last word. I'm incredibly proud of the work the committee has put forward today to rebuild and renew America, to combat the climate crisis, and create a more fair and equitable tax code. It drives a contrast with the work that our Republican friends did during their tax proposal, which failed to make a dent in corporate profit shifting, permitted 55 of the largest corporations to pay nothing in corporate tax uh, in 2020, and provides 83 percent of the benefits to the wealthiest 1 percent in the last year of their legislation. Today marks a significant step to decarbonize the economy and provides many provisions I've fought hard for. Mr. Chairman, you and I have worked for 10 years on these issues that deal with wind and solar tax credits. I appreciate what you and the subcommittee have done with the Green Act. Uh, I am proud that the 100 percent direct pay uh, to address project financing and tax equity are in there, extensions for small wind uh, investment tax credits, creation of a standalone credit for energy storage, the creation of the electric bike credit, reinstatement of the commuter bike tax, which was somehow gutted by our Republican friends with their tax bill. It expands electric vehicle charging stations for two- and three-wheeled vehicles. I'm especially proud of provisions to expand the bipartisan legislation I have for historic tax credits. We've worked for more than a decade, and as well as the provisions to reinstate the Superfund tax financing. This legislation also makes significant investments in working families and rewrites the tax code to make it more fair and equitable by extending the American Rescue Plan's child tax credit provisions, increasing the corporate tax rate and marginal tax rate for top earners, and rewiring our international tax system, this legislation makes America more economically competitive and equitable. Now, I'm listening to my Republican friends' arguments that fly in the face of the facts, documented by scholarship, by independent analysis, by our own staff and what most members actually know. Ironically, America paid much higher taxes in the Eisenhower era when the economy worked better uh, for most Americans, a 90 percent rate. It, they were higher rates with Ronald Reagan. Somehow, my friends are unable to calculate the total tax burden. They make comparisons about stated rates, for example, on the corporate tax. They don't include the value-added tax, which virtually all our competitors pay, which is a huge tax. There were references to China. They don't acknowledge the fact that China has a variety of value-added tax, up to 13 percent. That's why we already pay an effective tax rate, as my friend Mr. Doggett pointed out, of less than 8 percent. Less than 8 percent. It's, my friend Mr. Kelly points out, we're in a global economy. I acknowledge that. But somehow, my Republican friends cannot calculate the total tax burden. They ignore that value-added tax. They don't look at the difference between statutory rates and effective tax rates. These are elements that are easy to verify. The experts understand it. It's one of the reasons why we're working forward in an effort here to equalize the system, to collect revenues where it can appropriately be uh, uh, captured and redirected. 
Riches have flowed to the Americans at the, in the largest corporations and the wealthiest families. That's undeniable. We have an opportunity here to make modest adjustments to be able to be on the same playing field as our international competitors and American corporations and businesses will actually retain the fact that they are paying less taxes overall. And I just wish that we stop hearing phony comparisons that don't take into effect the total tax rate. This is what our staff tells us. This is what individual analysts present. You can verify this for yourself. And when you ignore the value-added tax and other taxes, you get a distorted picture. But I guess people who think that what happened on January 6 was kind of normal tourist behavior and they're not outraged uh, are schooled in denial. We should not be schooled in denial when we look at how these tax systems work. I appreciate what's done, Mr. Chairman. Look forward to supporting it going forward and appreciate the time to speak. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to strike the last word. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, as you know as well as I do, this this markup exercise is, is extremely misguided. It's it's one thing to waste the minority's time, but it's uh, it's another thing to waste your own member's time. Um, what we did here last week and continue to do today and tomorrow has no chance of becoming law. And we all know it. Thank goodness. We've seen Speaker Pelosi's game plan before. Since this markup began, it has been widely reported that whatever this committee does is dead on arrival in the Rules Committee. A source involved in the negotiations has been quoted saying, neither the White House or Senate Dems approve the Ways and Means package released today. Negotiations are ongoing. Do you know what that means? The Democrat Party is in complete disarray. Multiple members on their side have voted against numerous provisions during committee markups, and they have expressed overall skepticism of the size of the huge tax increases and of the timeline for this bill. And that's before we even get to the Senate's continuing concerns. I think it's fair to say that this package, as it sits, is going nowhere. But if the majority wants to give Republicans a platform to explain to the American people why their policies are so detrimental, then thank you. We're going to hear from Democrats today that tax, in, that, that tax increases are necessary because the Tax Cut and Jobs Act's gutted revenue. Well, that couldn't be farther from the truth. The reality is, is that under TCJA, revenues are up $539 billion, or 18%. And without any new tax hikes, our nation is on track for the biggest growth in revenues in 52 years, amounting to $3.8 trillion. But Democrats have another plan. The package before us today is a radical socialist spending spree that includes the largest tax increase ever proposed on working Americans. It contains more spending than the combined GDPs of Mexico and Canada. It spends 35 times more than what we invest yearly in our veterans' health care. And if enacted, the Bernie budget, combined with all Democrat spending since just 2019, will be more than the total taxes paid by all Americans in the history of the United States. In the meantime, our country is on pace to experience the highest yearly inflation in 40 years. As if this wasn't bad enough. On top of that, their drug pricing schemes included in this package will result in fewer cures and treatments for American patients. But it doesn't stop there, unfortunately. Democrats continue to further handicap our economy by creating welfare programs for the rich through green energy subsidies at the expense of the working class. Last Congress, Democrats told us 
all to calm down that the Green New Deal wasn't serious policy, but rather a set of ideals. Well, this bill proves that was a lie. With the creation of green welfare and sending tax credits to wealthy Americans who don't need government handouts, it's clear the Green New Deal was always the end game. Let's start with the basics. Can you imagine the government paying a couple living in San Francisco or New York City making $800,000 a year to buy an electric vehicle? Seems ridiculous, but this legislation would do just that. In fact, the government will write that couple a check for up to $12,500 to offset the cost of their brand new car. But what's, oh, and want a new electric bike for the holidays? Well, under the Democrats' plan, the government will help you with that too. Meanwhile, any money that could actually help Americans who need it most is completely wasted. The broadband provisions in this bill do nothing to direct funding to underserved areas like my district. Instead, it sends monies to areas that already have coverage. It's simple. Democrats are seeking to bail out their friends and donors in blue states with crushing energy policies on the backs of working class Americans. And while they will bail out these rich donors who want to be showered with taxpayer funding, they won't do anything to help people who need a regular car to get to their job. Remember, Speaker Pelosi is holding infrastructure hostage so that she can pass tax breaks for her wealthy buddies. So I asked my friends on the other side of the aisle, what are we even doing here? You're ducking any debate on the issues you actually care about because they don't fit your arbitrary narrative. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from, Pencil, uh, from uh, New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell, is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized. We're raring to go today, Mr. Chairman. You know, I just listened to what I consider to be, because I've heard it defined many times here, diatribe. I want everyone to know when I speak that I am against tax havens. You've done nothing because you said this was tax reform in 2017. The last tax reform we had, legislation, was back in uh, 1985, when Democrats and Republicans did work together. People like Senator Bradley, Congressman from New York State, Mr. Kemp. That's when we had tax reform. Don't call this tax reform what you did in 2017. I'm against tax shelters. You want to go into that? We'll be here all day. I'm against double taxation. I have never heard you speak about those things. I have never heard. In the 25 years I've been here, I've never heard you talk about any of these three. Put your cards on the table. What do you suggest we do about tax havens, tax shelters, and double taxation? I want to hear and government handouts. There are people who are starving out there. There are people who are working hard every day and getting nothing in return to improve their lot. Handouts. That's what it's come to? So we'll wait to help our donors, and then they'll eventually help those folks I just talked about. That's your philosophy. Unless you speak against it, it's your philosophy. So we're not going to subsidize any state any longer, the state of New Jersey. We're tired of it. Josh calls it moocher states. I have a better word for it, which I cannot say here in public. Let's not undersell this. Today we're finally tilting the scales from those at the top and building a better America. This is not soak the rich. This is pay your fair share. This is about tax fairness. Erasing the legacy 
of the tax scam we're, we're aware of in 2017. And you got the payback in 2018. This is about reversing the wealth gap that disproportionately impacts low-wage workers and people of color, and people in the middle class who you speak about today. You spoke about them. You talked about cops, firefighters, teachers maybe. They're all folks, mostly of whom are in the middle class. And right now in the state of New Jersey, they're not very happy about what you did in 2017 because what you did is gave them a big tax increase. When you said that I don't care if it goes back to the Civil War and you gave those people the right to deduct it in their federal income taxes, local taxes, they knew more than we did. The Civil War folks knew more than we did because they knew that the money was going towards the war and very little it was getting back into the local communities. They knew about it. Why don't you? So the bill today will make America stronger and fairer. By the way, the economist did a story just a few months ago about when does the economy improve for everybody under which regime showed the difference between Republican and Democrat. You'd be very surprised. Who raised the taxes and who got away with it? We're for everybody. Everybody's going to make out on this deal. Oh, really? It will support class families, working class families, and create good paying and green jobs. We're extending the American Rescue Plan. The tax credits that have cut child poverty in half. I have never heard anybody on the other side of the aisle even recognize that fact. You don't want it to happen. That's your problem. We're legalizing Medicare rec negotiations to usher in the largest Medicare expansion in generations. We're capping Part D out-of-pocket costs to finally stop forcing Americans to cho be choose between their wallets or their lives. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Arrington, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand uh, the passion uh, um, and respect that, uh, along with the views of my colleagues and Mr. Pascrell. Uh, the only thing I would say um, that is offensive is when somebody impugns the motives of our colleagues, and in this case, I, and, I, and, and I don't know that you really mean it, but to suggest that Republicans don't really care or want to see people lifted out of poverty is just wrong. We have a different view on how to get there. We don't think government programs are the way to do it. Some distant federal government program where there's all sorts of waste, fraud, and abuse, nameless, faceless bureaucrats running these programs. And we do believe, and I think the data bears this out, it does trap people in a cycle of poverty. It doesn't pull people up and out to be their very best and to, and to put into play their God-given talents and maximize their, their earning ability and to have a better life for their families. That's, that's what we've seen all too often, especially when you have welfare without work requirements. I think that's a disservice to the American people, to our fellow Americans, uh, to not give them those incentives. And we see this expansion of welfare and, and entitlements without those basic work requirements and personal responsibility. And it's offensive to people. It's offensive to folks who work hard just to make ends meet and they can't afford health care because somebody had a good idea that government health care was going to solve the access, quality, and cost of care by calling it the Affordable Care Act when it actually doubled the cost of care for working people. And, and the same in, in every space, in every sector where the government had, for whatever motive, decided that the, the, the government was going to be the solution to the problem, which is you know, why we've seen runaway inflation recently. And I can say that that is a direct, direct effect of the massive spending that's occurred 
just recently in the last COVID bill, $2 trillion, you're going to see more inflationary effects. Uh, you're going to see the debt now accelerated. That's a problem for all of us. I'm not going to give Republicans a pass on the debt, but you're accelerating the debt, which is, I think, the biggest threat to our country. I mean, we're almost $30 trillion in debt. This is not going to pay for itself. The Green New disaster doesn't pay for itself. All of the massive expansion in welfare and entitlements does not pay for itself. So it, we, we've got almost a trillion dollars in annual deficits uh, prior to COVID. Um, and none of this is going to go to pay down that, that deficit and accumulating, accumulating debt. It's only going to increase it. I don't see how anybody that has a modicum of fiscal responsibility in, in, in their sort of governing framework could support this. The, the, this I, think it, I think it is terribly irresponsible on so many levels, but the, I think the worst of it is nobody in this committee hearing is going to end up paying for this. It will be our posterity. It will be our children and grandchildren will pay for it at some point. I can't tell you when, but it will happen. There'll be a payday and it will be horrible. And, 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 uh, but, but look, the tax cuts and, and the facts have been articulated by my colleagues already lifted 6 million people out of poverty. And we celebrated that. It lowered unemployment to the lowest rates in 50 years. We celebrated that. It had the biggest increase in household median income on record, and we celebrated that. All boats rose on the tide of prosperity when we allowed people to keep more of their hard-earned money, and we allowed job creators to invest and create more opportunities. Turns out that's the best way to get people out of poverty. It's the best way to, um, to create wealth creation for folks, upward mobility, and we saw it in record uh, in, in spades, and we, and we saw it in record fashion. And so um, we're going to reverse all of that at the worst time, at the worst time. These job creators are uh, struggling with inflation. They're struggling because, and, and this is directly on my Democrat colleagues from having enhanced unemployment where people got paid more than they were paid in the previous job, and now we're going to put a big tax on them they can't handle all this. This will be devastating to our economy, devastating to our families. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. No, thank back. the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman word. is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This legislation represents a historic opportunity to prioritize children, families, and workers to advance economic and environmental justice and to grow our economy while asking the wealthiest and most secure to pay their fair share. It reduces child poverty via substantial child tax credit, coupled with the permanent modernization of the child and dependent care tax credit, which I've advocated for years. The science is clear that these investments will significantly reduce child poverty and greatly increase parental employment and earnings, especially for African Americans, single parents, and mothers younger than 25. In August alone, the Advanced Child Tax Credit gave caregivers $30.5 million to provide food, shelter, and other necessities for 121,000 children in my congressional district alone. I have championed enhancing the earned income tax credit to help childless workers and non-custodial parents since 2008 via my Responsible Fatherhood Act. In 2015, I advocated lowering the earned income tax credit eligibility age to 18 to help vulnerable younger workers and adopting special protections for foster and homeless youth. This legislation makes these investments in individual workers 
that will improve economic well-being, reduce poverty, and increase the labor force participation of millions of people. This legislation also helps low-income students by making Pell Grants non-taxable, removing the lifetime ban on the American Opportunity Tax Credit for past felony drug convictions, and helping expand broadband to low-income communities, all investments that I've promoted. It incents substantial private investments in solar energy that will put money in the pockets of millions of low-income individuals by reducing electricity costs while making the air they breathe safer. It includes strong labor provisions so that our investments in green energy benefit workers as well as businesses. Also, it encourages higher wages for child care workers to promote stability and quality in child care. It strengthens communities via the new markets tax credits, infrastructure, school construction, low-income housing, rehab, deteriorated housing, and strengthening public universities. It makes Americans healthier via enhanced tax credits to cover health insurance and to incent people to enter health careers and work in rural and underserved areas and it addresses racial and economic inequities for rural and underserved communities for those living in states that failed to expand Medicaid. It helps people afford the medicines they need to live healthy lives. I look forward to voting for this historic legislation and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Estes, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before the COVID-19 panic, our economy had taken off thanks to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and pro-growth policies that valued work and entrepreneurship. That's because Republicans in Congress focus our efforts on making sure that those who start a business on their kitchen table can work hard and take that company to Main Street. The result was the lowest unemployment in 50 years, with more people finding jobs in America than any time in our, in our history. But today, we're marking up a 900-page-plus tax bill with around $3 trillion in tax hikes and new loopholes geared at paying for this massive government expansion. The New York Times promoted the import, enormous impact that this legislation will have on the country by saying it would touch virtually every American at every point in life from conception to old age. Instead of focusing on getting the economy growing, can, Democrats have prioritized a grab bag of socialist policies that require massive tax hikes. One recent study from the Tax Foundation found that all of President Biden's proposed $6 trillion spending bill will shrink the economy by an entire percent over the next decade. Democrats seem to forget that just because a bill spends money doesn't make it a good investment. Washington, after all, has a lousy track record of making good investments with taxpayer dollars. As we finish marking up this massive tax hike, I fear that many small businesses who have fought so hard to stay afloat while battling large companies that had an easier time bearing the burdens of the shutdown will ultimately fail under the tax and regulatory regime of the Biden administration. The Joint Committee on Taxation has found that two-thirds of President Biden's corporate tax hike will be felt by middle-income taxpayers, including the small businesses that file taxes as individuals. The Joint Committee on Taxation estimated it will lower federal revenues by around $1.2 trillion over the next decade. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017 did the opposite by increasing federal revenue through expanded economic activity. And Democrats' so-called good investments only get worse when you dig more into the details of the tax hikes and giveaways. The Green New Deal programs within the bill will make families across the U.S. pay more in taxes so the millionaires in California can ride off that new Tesla. As we emerge from the pandemic, our focus needs to be on rebuilding the economy in a way we know works. This begins by removing hurdles to new business formation and implementing policies that allow our small businesses to grow. Instead, Democrats are doubling down on the radical expansion of government through Green New Deal policies, subsidized health care, and a weaponized IRS. Make no mistake, this unprecedented expansion of Washington will come at the expense of working families and small businesses. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week, this committee made historic investments in working families 
on a level that we have not seen in generations. And today our work continues. Every family deserves clean air and water, the resources to care for each other, and a tax code that isn't stacked against them. And yet these fundamental necessities are out of reach for so many in the communities that I represent. It's up to us to change that, Mr. Chairman, and I'm proud that the remaining pieces of the Build Back Better Act will help us to do so. Earlier this year, the American Rescue Plan made a historic down payment in expanding the child tax credit that has helped lift millions of children and their families out of poverty. This package builds on that commitment, and I want to thank the chairman for ensuring that this enhanced benefit is available to all children, including immigrants, as the child tax credit was always intended to be. It also makes permanent another provision I have long championed to expand the dependent care assistance program so that working parents can save more of their hard-earned paychecks pre-tax for child care. And this bill will further make a real difference for families in my district by making permanent the American Rescue Plan's expansion of the child and dependent care credit. But families aren't just struggling to afford care for children. We sometimes make the mistake of forgetting the importance of care at the other end of life. That is why I'm particularly proud that this package includes a version of my bill, the Bipartisan Credit for Caring Act. Too many family caregivers must leave the workforce when their loved one has no one else to lean on. They are disproportionately women and women of color, and too often they face the emotional and financial burden of caregiving alone. They deserve our help. This new credit will help shield families from financial hardships when life throws its toughest curveballs at them. By caring for each other, but caring for each other also means ensuring we have an environment that allows all communities to thrive. That is why this package's investments in clean energy and energy efficiency are so important. In particular, I'm grateful that a tax credit I have sponsored that incentivizes energy efficiency and good paying union jobs is included. I'm also proud to have worked with my colleague, Representative Davis, to extend the benefits of clean energy to all communities through the Low Income Housing Renewable Energy Credit. Finally, I want to thank the committee for including investments that I've been proud to champion to help struggling musicians get back on their feet. I urge my colleagues not to be distracted by arguments that the in these investments are just wasteful spending. Not when the wealthiest and multinational corp uh, corporations got a huge giveaway four years ago. Not when I'm heard from constituents who are skipping their medications and watering down their dosages because they cannot make ends meet. Not when this package is fully paid for at a time of extraordinary income inequality. Too many of us take the fundamental necessities of life for granted. So many Americans never have to worry about finding care for a loved one. And finally, we should never have to watch children grow up at a higher risk of asthma because of the zip code that they live in. But far too many of my constituents do, and it's in our power to change that today. And if we build back better by actually investing in working families, we can. I urge my colleagues to support this bill. And before I yield back, I just want to set the record straight on the revisionist nature that my Republican colleagues have towards the TCJA. They said that it would be so simple that, that their tax reform would allow us to be able to file our income tax on a postcard. Well, that didn't happen. They said that multinationals would reinvest in their facilities and hire more workers. Well, that didn't happen. What these multinationals did was increase CEO pay and buy back stock. They said it created the lowest unemployment rates, um, and while unemployment rates might have been low, that's because many people had to work two and three jobs just to scrape by. And in the three years before the pandemic, one in three households with kids and half of black and Latino households with children experienced a major financial hardship, such as an inability to afford adequate food, housing, or utilities. So this mantra by my Republican colleagues that we, we shouldn't be making these investments, they want to make the investments for the wealthiest few and for multinational corporations. 
we want to invest in working families and make sure that we can get people back into the workforce. I ask my colleagues to support this package of bills, and I yield back to the chairman. Thank the gentlewoman. Um, Ms. Sewell, you're recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. You're recognized. Mr. Chairman, today this committee will continue with the work to rebuild our economy. This portion of the overall bill before us today aims to rectify the issues created by TCJA in 2017 with substantive policies crafted to benefit all Americans, not just corporations and the wealthy. Subtitle F of this legislation consists of a framework derived from the LIFT Act that I introduced earlier this year. This bill language will expand common sense bond financing opportunities for local governments and nonprofits. Furthermore, it will provide a number of flexible financing tools that meet the unique needs of communities across the country, including transportation, public health facilities, schools, and other infrastructure and economic development projects. This bill will also restore the ability of states and localities to refinance existing debt through advanced refundings. This critical cost-saving tool enjoys bipartisan support and would reduce the cost of borrowing for critical infrastructure projects and allow our local governments to take advantage of low in interest rate environment. This provision is exactly what the cities and towns in Alabama's 7th Congressional District need to build back better in the wake of COVID-19. Our tax code has several tools within it that have proven to offer economic incentives, especially in rural and underserved communities. There is no tool better than the new market tax credit. This reconciliation language will incorporate my new market tax credit expansion act, which will permanently authorize and expand new market tax credits. This credit has proven to be an effective targeted and cost efficient financing tool valued by businesses, nonprofits, and communities alike. As we continue to strive to do better and be better stewards of our environment, we must always remind ourselves of the next generation inheriting our world. An investment in, our chi in, an investment in a child is an investment in our future. Mr. Chairman, thanks to your leadership, the work of this committee regarding the child tax credit is the best down payment this nation can make in our next generation. I am proud that this legislation will expand and continue to provide advanced payments to those families through 2025. The child tax credit has proven to be a lifeline to millions of American families during this pandemic, and that is especially true in my district. It has been a source of revenue, it has been a source of relief for those who have had to weather some of the largest challenges COVID has presented. It has kept our children warm, fed, and clothed during this unparalleled time and of economic uncertainty. We have an obligation to the American people and must ensure that everything is being done to protect individuals and their families by providing affordable, high quality health care, especially during this once in a generation public health crisis. That is why I support the American Rescue Plan and support the Build Back Better agenda and its efforts to make improvements to the ACA by helping Alabamians access health care by, by advancing uh, premium tax credits and making them permanent. Mr. Chairman, when I think of health equity, there are a lot of constituents in my, in my district that come to mind, including members of my own family. I think about the distance that so many of my constituents must travel to access health care and the hospitals that have closed or are at risk of closing. That is why Medicaid expansion and closing the coverage gap are the most important initiatives when it comes to rural health care. There are 135 rural hospitals that have closed since 2010. Seven of them are in Alabama. The writing is on the wall. Nearly 90% of the rural health closures in recent years have been in states that did not expand Medicaid. In states that have not expanded Medicaid, the uninsured rate for women of childbearing years is nearly twice as high as those states that have expanded. Specifically, black women are two to three times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. Today, only five of the 14 counties in my district have hospitals with OBGYN, with OBGYN divisions. As hospitals close, 
women are likely to drive even further to access care. I believe that Medicaid expansion is critical to providing health coverage to the working poor and improving the visibility and financial viability of our rural hospital. Let's pass this budget bill and build back better for all Americans. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlewoman. Ms. Delbaney, you're recognized to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, we take a crucial step in addressing the economic inequities that so many face in our country and that were made worse by the pandemic. In particular, this package includes an extension of the expanded child tax credit. This has long been a priority of mine because of the impact it would have on our children, their families, and their futures. It is key to rebuilding our middle class. I want to thank my partners, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro and Congressman Richie Torres for helping to lead this effort. And many thanks to Chairman Neal for all of his work to help us get here. First and foremost, the child tax credit is a critical tax cut for middle class families. The monthly payments that started in July are reaching over 36 million households, over 60 million kids in Democratic, Republican, and purple districts like mine. Already, 3.3 million more parents have been able to provide food for their children. And 3 million children have been kept out of poverty. Some still think the cost of the CTC expansion is too high. But let me be clear, the child tax credit is not frivolous spending. It's an investment in our children and the program actually saves money in the long run. According to Columbia University, the expanded child tax credit would save $8 for every $1 that we put in. And while the initial investment is large, it is small in comparison to the economic and societal return that we're already starting to see and would see going forward. Others have said that we need to so-called means test the program. Well, in the American Rescue Plan, we adjusted the child tax credit's income phase-out thresholds from the Republican tax law. Republicans had thresholds of 400,000 for joint filers and 200,000 for single or head of household filers. In the American Rescue Plan, those went down to 150,000 and 112,500 respectively to target the families that need the benefit the most. And we made the credit refundable to reach the children whose families earn too little to receive the full benefit. Currently, the expanded child tax credit is reaching 90% of all kids in the US, middle class and lower income families. And this is estimated to cut child poverty in half and we cannot shortchange our kids. This package also includes another priority of mine in expansion of the low income housing tax credit or LIHTC. Over 30% of all households nationwide, over 37 million households are spending more than 30% of their income on housing. 17 million are spending at least half of their income on housing. It's simply unsustainable. This bill makes bold and durable change to address this ballooning crisis. This package extends the temporary 12.5% increase in LIHTC state allocations, which have already resulted in more than 59,000 affordable homes than otherwise would have been possible and increases the amount of an, by an additional 50% for the next seven years. Additionally, the package will increase the number of affordable rental homes that can be built using private activity bonds, which will significantly boost affordable housing production. Finally, we improve the housing credit program to better serve extremely low income individuals and families with an additional 10% allocation increase, as well as increase the ability to serve at risk and underserved communities, including Native American and rural communities. These important production provisions stem from my bipartisan legislation, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act, which would produce 1.38 million affordable rental homes over the next decade and serve more than 2 million low income people. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record a letter from the steering committee of the A Call to Invest in Our Neighbors Action Campaign commending the historic investment we make in the low income housing tax credit production provisions in this bill. So ordered.
Thank you. Addressing the nationwide affordable housing crisis will take a comprehensive and holistic approach and we can't, that can't be solved without vastly increasing the supply of affordable rental homes. And this bill's housing credit production provisions do just that. And finally, today's package builds on the Affordable Care Act by making permanent the enhanced premium subsidies enacted by the American Rescue Plan and fills the Medicaid coverage gap created by Republican governors who refuse to expand Medicaid, both of which are top health priorities for the New Dem coalition that I chair. Middle income families who are previously ineligible for federal savings saw their monthly premiums drop by nearly $200 per month on average. The Build Back Better Act is meeting this moment with bold and lasting action, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to advance this important work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Chu, to strike the last word. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last the, word. The gentlelady is recognized. Today, we take a historic step to build back better an economy in which we prioritize people over profits. Earlier this year, Democrats made significant expansion in the child tax credit, earned income tax credit, and the child and dependent care tax credit. And I'm proud to say that we will continue these investments in the American people. The expansion of the child tax credit is already cutting child poverty in this country in half. And I'm so proud we are extending this historic measure. The credit will remain fully refundable to support the lowest income households and taxpayers will continue to have the option to receive a monthly payment from the IRS to help cover everyday expenses. And I'm especially proud that this bill corrects the injustice from the 2017 Republican tax bill that made an estimated 1 million immigrant children ineligible for the credit. This change means Afghan refugee children will also be able to benefit from the child tax credit as they establish their new lives here in America. The expansions for the earned income tax credit in this bill will continue to support childless workers, including by increasing the income limit to include more of the working poor. And as families continue to patch their child care together during the pandemic, our expansion of the child care and dependent tax credit will provide families with some peace of mind that they are able to recoup up to $4,000 for the cost of caring for one child and $8,000 for two or more on their tax returns. This bill also makes investments in our communities by helping local governments stretch their public dollars further with the, new, with the new Build America bonds. And I'm so very thrilled to see many improvements to the low income housing tax credit, including uh, in this legislation to ensure that we accelerate the building of more affordable housing in communities across this country. Building Back Better also provides an opportunity to tackle the climate crisis head on. We are addressing the historic drought in California and across the Western US by ensuring that water conservation is not penalized by the tax code. We are helping transit agencies to invest in zero emission electric buses and investing in tax credits for electric cars, trucks, and bicycles. And we are ensuring that we can meet our target of carbon-free power by 2035 by expanding our investment in both home and utility scale, renewable energy and grid modernization. Crucially, we are doing all of this in a way that ensures American workers will benefit by ensuring that companies pay prevailing wages, incentivizing domestic manufacturing and rewarding unionized workplaces. And I'm thrilled that this bill takes critical steps to ensure every American has affordable health coverage as we continue to fight the Delta variant across the country. This package makes permanent the enhancements to advanced premium tax credits enacted in the American Rescue Plan, including ensuring that the advanced premium tax credits offered through 
the Affordable Care Act, eliminating the cliff at 400% of the federal poverty level. Additionally, this bill takes a giant step towards eliminating the health insurance coverage gap left by states who refuse to expand Medicaid to their low-income populations by making those populations eligible for subsidies for an ACA plan. Finally, it includes long overdue provisions that will allow Medicare to finally negotiate for the prices of prescription drugs. With drug prices continuing to skyrocket, it's essential that we grant Medicare this power and end years of inaction due to pressures from big pharma. And Democrats will pay for all of this by ensuring that wealthy people and corporations pay their fair share. And I'm particularly pleased that we are making historic investments to the IRS to fairly enforce our tax code after a decade of Republicans defunding the tax place. I urge support of this package and I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know my time is limited, so I'm going to try to fit in as much on this important legislation uh, as I possibly can. You know, our American workers and their families, my constituents, deserve a resilient and vibrant economy. And this bill tackles inequities that left unaddressed will only be exacerbated and will continue to limit economic development. It's just surprising to me that our colleagues on the other side that don't recognize that income inequality and not providing for the least of these skews our economy in a way that is unproductive. But under your leadership, Mr. Chairman, this committee continues to take meaningful steps to meet the challenges our nation faces. That includes fighting climate change and making long overdue infrastructure investments that create good paying jobs. <laughs> um, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I am particularly um, uh, happy that in addition to fighting climate change and making long overdue infrastructure investments that create these good paying jobs, I'm pleased that the committee print includes my bill that helps homeowners afford home energy audits that can help them reduce energy costs. You know, knowledge is power. And another important provision that I have fought for would allow tribal entities, which are tax exempt, to directly take advantage of tax credits to support the deployment of renewable energy investments. We must expand access to these incentives to native communities that will be impacted by climate change. And while we're talking about expanded access, I'm also pleased to see that the committee has extended the electric vehicle charging stations with criteria to incentivize the installation of publicly accessible charging infrastructure. Also, I've been really engaged throughout my career in efforts to lower the cost of bonds issued by states and local governments, reauthorizing direct pay bonds and reinstating the tax exemption for interest on advanced refunding bonds are key to upgrading our nation's infrastructure and helping communities meet the needs of their residents. Our affordable housing crisis is acute. So I'm so happy that the low income housing tax credit uh, has a proven record and I welcome the changes we've put forward to strengthen this tool, like providing an enhanced credit amount and incentivizing projects that will serve extremely low income households. We're also tackling uh, poverty. We're making the child tax credit, the CTC, permanently refundable so the benefits will no longer exclude the families most in need. We're extending the boost of the CTC and its advanced payment regime, and we cannot overstate the value gained to the well-being of families and children benefits that extend to our society at large that come from these improvements of the CTC. We're also permanently strengthening the earned income tax credit uh, so that it no longer discriminates against child workers by boosting the maximum credit amount, eliminating the upper age limit and lowering the minimum age limit. These are changes that are incorporated in my own EITC bill. And I applaud the commitment of the chair to improving the EITC. There's still so much more that we need to do this crucial credit, including to provide support to students and caregivers. 
tens of millions of unpaid and unsung caregivers across our country each day provide critical support to family members, friends, and neighborhoods, often at personal and financial cost to themselves. These caregivers provide services that enable the caregiver to stay in their home uh, rather than being institutionalized. And in 2013, it was estimated this unpaid caregiving amounted to about $407 billion in value. And this bill creates uh, and, and recognizes the value of caregiving by providing a $4,000 offset for these expenses. It's a start. We're also making good on our promise to address skyrocketing prescription drug costs. We can't stand by any longer while our constituents are tri tri triangulating between ne necessitating uh, necessary expenses. They're spending four times more than other countries on these drugs. And by allowing the government to negotiate for lower uh, prices, we're reining in an industry that's gotten away with murder. And finally, in partnership with the Energy and Commerce Committee, we're helping close the Medicaid coverage gap. This is something that I've been leading on. An estimated 4.4 million vulnerable, vulnerable Americans lack coverage through the ACA because of GOP legislators Michael Wisconsin have denied them. They're still sitting on their hands. Well, Mr. Chair, I see that my time has expired, but I can't go on um, without reminding uh, the committee of how important this is and voting yes on passage of this historic legislation, and I would yield back. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from uh, Michigan, Mr. Kildee, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to speak in strong support of this legislation that we're considering today and highlight a couple of areas that I've worked on closely with you and others on this committee. Included in this legislation is a tax credit to support the expansion of electric vehicle manufacturing in the United States to help create good paying American jobs and help us meet our goals to combat the climate crisis. The transportation sector is currently the largest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions. And as we work to create and increase the number of electric vehicles on the road and expand charging stations, cars will emit less greenhouse gases than traditional internal combustion engines. The future of the automotive industry is electric. Indeed, the market is already moving in that direction. But now, the cost of electric vehicles is often higher than their gas-powered counterparts. My legislation would provide a credit to help promote electric vehicle adoption and make it more affordable for working and middle-class Americans. I come, as many of you have heard me say, I come from Flint, Michigan, a city that put the world on wheels. In Flint and throughout the state of Michigan, automobiles mean good-paying American jobs. And that's why the credit that I've offered will support American jobs, especially those jobs with agreements that ensure the highest labor standards, worker safety, wages, and benefits. When we are spending American tax dollars, they should go to support well-compensated American workers. The labor movement built the middle class and creates good-paying jobs that can support a family. So I'm proud that this legislation has the support of the United Auto Workers, the AFL-CIO, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Further, this legislation improves current law to ensure that the middle class, not the wealthiest, benefit from these tax credits. The electric vehicle tax credit is fully refundable at the point of sale, so consumers see an immediate reduction in the cost of their vehicle. Our legislation also aligns with President Biden's promise not to raise taxes on Americans making less than $400,000 a year while preventing this credit from going toward the purchase of luxury vehicles. And I just want to say I want to correct an impression that was left uh, earlier in the question period. Uh, uh, a a um, hypothetical was posed about an individual making $750,000 buying an $80,000 vehicle. Under no circumstance would that individual nor that vehicle qualify under the provisions in this credit. In fact, for a sedan, we're talking about a $55,000 MSRP cap. This is intended to make sure that everyday Americans have access to affordable vehicles. We're not going to subsidize the wealthiest 
purchasing luxury vehicles. And so I'm proud to have strong support of this, uh, for this legislation from environmental groups, from unions, from our domestic automakers like GM, Ford, Stellantis. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I thank you uh, for your support of many of the provisions that support American workers. The legislation also includes funding for auto communities through the 48C program to help them as they transition from making gas-powered vehicles to electric vehicles. In addition, I'd also like to highlight a few other provisions that I've worked on. When I uh, introduced the Working Families Tax Relief Act with Congressman Evans to expand the child and earned income tax credit, this is what we had hoped for. This provision will provide a much needed tax cut for working and middle class families with children. The legislation also pr uh, includes provisions to support economic development on tribal lands. Tribes don't want special treatment under the tax code. They just want to be treated like any other government. This bill brings parity in the tax code for tribes, and I'm proud to have supported this work. Mr. Chairman, congratulations on working with members of this committee. I continue to support working families. I strongly support this legislation, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, to strike the last word. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you uh, and the staff uh, especially uh, for your hard work over the last several weeks and months and for the inclusion in this bill uh, of many uh, pieces that, that I fought for and, and championed. And I just want to highlight a couple. First is with respect to the reform that is in here in terms of higher education, helping to incentivize and reward those colleges and universities that spend on financial aid. As a first generation college student myself, I know how important those college aid packages are. And I'm excited that my provision has been able to be uh, included in this piece of legislation. I also want to follow up on what Mr. Kildee said about 48C. Last term, I had a bill that was included in the Green Act, and I'm glad that now we see this again uh, in this piece of legislation. This will create good paying union jobs that help accelerate our transition to clean energy. But more than, than individual um, proposals or individual provisions of this bill, let me for a moment just speak more globally. What a difference, what a clear contrast between what Republican unified rule looks like in this Congress and this country versus unified democratic rule. Four years ago, the first thing a united Republican control of Washington attempted to do was repeal and not replace the Affordable Care Act, which would have taken away health insurance for more than 20 million Americans. They were successful in passing that in the House, but famously failed by one vote in the Senate. After that failed, they immediately turned to the one thing that can unite Republicans of all stripes, tax cuts for the rich. And they pushed through the $2 trillion tax cut, which according to CBO, 83% of which went to the richest 1%. Fast forward four years later, and we have Washington, D.C. under unified Democratic control. And what does that mean? The most transformative domestic piece of legislation since the mid-1960s. Just think of the things between the two sessions last week today and what we'll be doing tomorrow. Just think of the historic things that we are about to pass. Truly transformative in helping the lives of so many ordinary Americans here in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, but throughout our nation. It is a pretty clear contrast of the priorities of this administration and this Congress. I am not just a, a yes vote, as you can probably tell, for this uh, piece of legislation. I am an enthusiastic yes. And as I said in my strike the last word last week, this is truly historic. Millions and millions of ordinary, hardworking Americans will dramatically have their lives helped by what we are doing here in this committee last week and this week and what we'll be doing on the full floor 
in a short uh, period in the future. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me call upon the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Beyer, to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for all of your extraordinary leadership through this difficult time. Mr. Chairman, my vote for the American Rescue Plan, which provided desperately needed assistance to a million of Americans and put us on the path to recovering from the pandemic, was the most consequential vote I have ever cast. I believe that the legislation we're marking up today is even more significant. This bill illustrates that we have risen to the great challenges of our time that past Congress's administrations have failed to fully address. The first is the existential threat of climate change. This bill will be the single most important piece of climate legislation we have ever had the chance of passing. And as the International Panel on Climate Change constantly reminds us, the next decade is pivotal to determine our future climate path and the danger of heat increase which may inflict upon ourselves. We owe it to our children, our grandchildren, and the many generations to come to make this legislation a reality. Not only are we making massive investments in the technologies that will reduce our carbon emissions to help stave off the worst effects of a changing climate, we're also setting ourselves up to be the leaders in the sectors that will define the emerging clean energy economy. I'm especially proud of the work that Representative Jimmy Panetta and I have done on the Green Van Act, which uses tax policy to speed the adoption of electric and zero emission commercial vehicles. According to the EPA, transportation is the single largest source of emissions in the United States, and the transition of commercial vehicles lags far behind personal vehicles. The generous tax credits we provide in this legislation will help upgrade the nation's fleet of working vehicles from plumber's vans to tractor trailers into efficient zero emission models. Another key provision in the package we are considering is the Net Zero Act, which I introduced with Representative Del Bene, a dramatic expansion of the tax credit for direct air capture. I've heard again and again from scientists about the importance of complementing the shift to clean energy sources with the development of negative emissions technology like direct air capture that can actually remove carbon emission from the air. Together with my colleagues, we've crafted provision that will hasten the development and deployment of direct air capture technology, a critical part of our long-term strategy. The National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine says we need to take a gigaton of CO2 out of the atmosphere each year by 2050 just to hit the Paris targets. I'm also extremely pleased to see the inclusion of the Clean Hydrogen Production and Investment Tax Credit, which we created with Representative Larson's leadership. This legislation to support development of hydrogen energy would help power an important shift of part of our shift to a cleaner transportation sector and create thousands of new green jobs. And an important forgotten but, but really important sector to address emissions is in our buildings, which is 13% of our emissions. And I'm proud to work with Representative Blumenauer on the Energy Efficient Commercial Buildings Act, which was included here to incentivize the reduction of emissions in commercial vehicles. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to highlight the important work that Representatives Bowman and Nadler, Senators Van Hollen, Sanders, Markey, Warren, and Merkley um, have done on the Polluters Pays Climate Fund Act. This would simply require the largest fossil fuel producers in America, maybe 25 of them, to pay for the greenhouse gas emissions they have emitted over the last 20 years. This is a straightforward and just option to raise added revenue to pay for all the climate investments that we must make. The second challenge we face in this legislation is the widening gap between rich and poor that is tearing at the fabric of our society. This bill puts us on a path to a much more equitable society. In the American Rescue Plan, we expanded and improved the child tax credit, one of the most important beneficial things Congress has done in this or any other century. We put real dollars into the lives of 61 million children in August. The bill before us, we extend this till 2025. It's estimated that the enhancements of this child tax credit will cut the nation's poverty rate in half. And I really want to thank Representative Susan Delbeni for all her leadership on this. Another key element is the large expansion to the low income housing tax credit, also led by Susan Delbeni, and I've been trying to help her. This will create hundreds of thousands of, of new homes for Americans. And one of the most important pieces of the bill is the drug pricing reform. Americans have the highest cost of health care in the world and everyday stories of bankruptcy due to health care costs. Lastly, the inclusion in this bill of the 3% surtax on individuals with gross incomes over $5 million, very similar to legislation that Senator Chris Van Hollen and I proposed last year, 
This is an elegant and simple way to raise the necessary revenues to make these important investments while also increasing the fairness of our tax code. Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to speak and for your efforts to craft this historic legislation. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair would recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Evans, to strike the last word. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. The Ways and, Me Ways and Means Committee now has an opportunity to you. advance big and bold proposals that will strengthen our communities and support American families and workers. The provisions before us include the vital extension of the fully refundable child <clears throat> tax credit and the expansion of the earned income tax credit. Children's hunger and financial distress have fallen considerably in the fall of these poverty busters, benefiting many of our nation's low wage and essential workers. We are considerably, we are considering tax incentives that will make our neighborhoods safer and more livable and help Americans afford health coverage. We are also help taking important steps to reduce costs of prescription drugs. This historical package includes my bill that includes removing barriers, preventing older public schools from taking advantage of the rehabilitation tax credit. Students and teachers in Philadelphia, where the average age of the school is 70 years old, and across the nation deserves to learn and work in safe environments, free of asbestos, mold, and other hazards. While local officials have worked with, with limited funding to address these risks, public schools need federal investment. Other important community development measures include the Low Income Tax Credit, the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, and two key tools in boosting the development and rehabilitation of rural housing. Today's green energy proposal will help address the economics and the health impact of climate change and include tax credit to support environmental justice research that was initiated by someone who we all love, the late Congressman John Lewis. I recently introduced related legislation with his successor, Representative Williams. Lastly, I want to encourage my colleagues not to shy away from <coughs> raising measures that fund our priorities and restore fairness to our tax code. Through the programs we are creating here, we are giving the American people the tools in the toolbox to improve their lives and rebuild human infrastructure of this country. Let me repeat that. Through the programs we are creating here, we are giving the American people the tools in the toolbox to improve their lives and rebuilding human infrastructure. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the staff for the leadership that you have consistently provided to this committee in a bipartisan way to show us the way. I join with you on this legislation, and I will support it in this committee and on the floor. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman very much, and let me recognize. And let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Schneider, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. Thank you, and, and Mr. Chairman, I want to express my gratitude for your leadership in crafting this legislation, the foundation of the Build Back Better Act, as well. I want to thank the committee staff and also my own team for their incredible and tireless work in this effort. The bill text we are marking today is the culmination of years of work on this committee. Ultimately, with this legislation as the guide, the Build Back Better Act will make unprecedented investments in America's fight against global climate change and in the competitiveness of America's workers and businesses. And it will enhance critical support for American families and something I hope we can all celebrate, lift 3.6 million American children out of poverty. This bill is not perfect, nor does it accomplish all that everyone wants, but it accomplishes so much and merits our support. Idealists might say, I will not support anything until I get exactly what I want. But the realists know that to make progress and to put our nation on the path to a more prosperous and more secure future, we have to be willing to make tough choices. 
This legislation is a prime example of Congress taking on the challenges that face us, such as the existential threat of climate change, and empowers working families with the resources they need, like the child tax credit, affordable child care, and universal paid leave. I'm proud the two bills I have championed, the Sustainable Skies Act and the Greener Transportation for Communities Act, have been included in this legislation to fight climate change. The Sustainable Skies Act would invest in America's capacity to decarbonize avi aviation by providing a federal incentive for sustainable aviation fuel. Working toward eliminating aviation em emissions, which represents 2% of the world's carbon emissions, is a monumental step to decarbonizing our economy. Just last week, I joined with National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy, Cabinet Secretaries Granholm, Vilsack, and Buttigieg, and Senator Brown and Congresswoman Brownlee to support our work on SAF. The legislation in today's bill, in combination with the Biden administration's whole of government work, has earned widespread support from the aviation industry groups like Chicago's own United Airlines to environmental groups like the Environmental Defense Fund and the World Wildlife Fund. I also want to assure my colleague from Nebraska, we are actively working on language to resolve the issue you raised. Our goal has long been to have the domestic eligibility standard for SAF to be functionally independent from ICAO. I'm actively working with Chairman Neal on our, and our diverse group of stakeholders, including biofuel producers, environmental groups, and the aviation industry to include this language going forward. I would also like to submit for the record two letters from our coalition of biofuels producers, the aviation industry, organized labor, and others in support of our legislation. So ordered. Thank you. The Greener Transportation for Communities Act will help America expand our electro, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, a critical part of electrifying, electrifying the national fleet of vehicles and decarbonizing on-the-ground transportation. Again, a huge and necessary undertaking if we are serious about combating climate change. These examples only scratch the surface of climate progress made by this bill. The single largest, single largest federal investment in combating the climate crisis and the down payment on clean future for America. Truly, we are building back better. American families and workers will be better off with the Build Back Better Act. They will receive tax cuts through the child tax credit. They will be healthier with the Affordable Care Act expanded and with more doctors trained to treat them. And we will create jobs in our own communities with investments in infrastructure. In order to pay for these critical investments in the American workforce and the American economy, we had to make responsible cho choices with changes to U.S. tax policy. With my colleagues, I raised concerns about how we needed a thoughtful approach that protected U.S. competitiveness. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you being responsive to those concerns. And I look forward to continuing this conversation as the legislation process moves forward. I thank the gentleman. I've also raised I've also raised concerns about our need to promote and protect the innovative engine that has driven the U.S. economy throughout our history. My state of Illinois has a long history of innovation and creation of new industries dating back to the Industrial Revolution. This innovation has created millions of quality American jobs in everything from basic manufacturing to advanced high tech. In my own district in the northern suburbs of Chicago, we have the sixth highest concentration of manufacturing jobs of any congressional district. Among the mix of industries, I'm proud of what I call the life science corridor, running through the center of my district and reflecting the breadth and depth of healthcare, pharmaceutical, and bioscience companies, large and small, leading innovation for future generations. This innovation is why our nation has championed the fight against COVID, and I believe we have more work to do as we consider changes to policies that will impact critical research and development. That said, I believe the proposals we're considering today protect U.S. competitiveness, support working families, and give small businesses a tax cut. I'm deeply proud of our work today. I thank you, and with that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have been listening to a lot of the different comments from both sides here today, and I just want to say that we need balance in our country. And uh, our system in America is based upon two major concepts, capitalism and democracy. Capitalism is the best system in the world. It's lifted more people out of poverty. It's created more innovation. It's healed more sickness. It's the best system in the world. It's based upon competition. The stronger you are, the smarter you are, the harder working you are, the more risk taking you are, the luckier you are, the better you're gonna do. Unfortunately, some people in our society are not great competitors. So babies are not good competitors. Senior citizens that are frail are not good competitors. People with cancer or mental health 
issues are not good competitors. People that have been hit by a car or had other unlucky circumstances. People subject to systemic inequities in our society are not always good competitors. People who are treated badly as children aren't necessarily good competitors. So we say, just because you're not a good competitor doesn't mean you should have a miserable life because we have another system called democracy that says all men and women are created equal. And we need to do things as government to try and smooth out some of those rough edges to make sure that people who are not good competitors aren't necessarily subjected to a life of misery. The challenge for us in government and politics, Democrats and Republicans, is to try and find a balance between those two systems of capitalism and democracy on a knife's edge where you can make life better for people. If you go all the way, all men and women are created equal, place too much regulation in place, you killed the goose that laid the golden egg that someone referred to before. If you do all capitalism 100%, you end up with a bunch of people with a miserable lifestyle. I believe that this bill that's being marked up by this committee right now is a great example of the balance that we've tried to find to try and help people, to keep the economic engine of our country strong, but to protect us from some of the inequities that exist in our system. Keep the economic engine of capitalism strong, but make sure that all men and women are created equal, to protect the babies, to protect the frail elderly, to protect people without health insurance, to protect people caught up by the inequities of our society, while at the same time protecting against one of the biggest threats that we face in our country right now, which is, and in the world, which is climate change. So I believe that this bill that we are marking up today is a great opportunity for us to find balance in our country, to keep our economic engine of our country strong and moving forward while addressing the inequities that exist sometimes in our society. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Panetta, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I speak in strong support and commend the committee and its staff for our work on this legislation that would provide for a necessary and timely investment in our infrastructure, in our resilience, and of course, in our self-reliance. It's legislation that not only pays for itself, but it puts forward forward-thinking solutions to pressing issues in our country, and especially in my district on the Central Coast of California, including the effects of climate change, the lack of affordable housing, and the viability Test, test. Hello? Test, test. How was that? <laughs> Good? <laughs> All set? Okay. You got – good. We got the thumbs up. Thank you. Uh, look, this legislation addresses our climate challenge by working to decarbonize our transportation sector and our energy sector. To do that, this bill includes provisions for my legislation that gets more butts on bikes and more butts in buses, provisions that provide tax credits to those with low to modest incomes to buy e-bikes and to our communities to buy zero emission buses. There's also provisions for my other legislation for tax credits for purchasing microgrid controllers and clean burning linear generators to increase our energy resiliency and our individual reliability. I'm also pleased that this legislation accounts for the need of affordable housing in all of our communities, with the work done by Representative Del Benny to improve and increase the low-income housing tax credit, and with my legislation to reduce the financing test for projects funded with tax-exempt bonds so that we can double the value of our federal credits for affordable housing products. With this bill, we are continuing to show our commitment to working families by not only extending the child tax credit, but by also taking a crucial step that I have fought for to repeal the Social Security number requirement so that every child, especially in my farm worker communities and their families, have access to that <coughs> much needed benefit. As I mentioned these investments, I want to highlight that we are doing it in a responsible way by raising revenue. 
although we are making changes to the estate tax, my bipartisan Protecting Family Farms Act raises a limitation on special use valuations that would ensure that family farms and small businesses are valued not just for their development value, but rather for their value of their business and farming operation. I believe our farmers deserve that provision, and our nation is demanding this bill for our infrastructure, for our working families, and for the restoration of faith in our institutions by reminding the American public that we can do big things for them and for our future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Murphy, to strike the last word. Um, I yield back, Mr. The, Chair. The gentlelady has yielded back her time. The gentleman from California, Mr. Gomez, is recognized to strike the last word. Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chairman, we are here to right the wrongs of the Republican Donald Trump tax bill that benefited primarily the very wealthy and the largest corporations, and to build back a better and more equitable America. To understand who they prioritize and who we prioritize, you just need to see how corporations were treated under their bill and how individuals were treated under their bill. Corporations had their tax rate cut by almost 40% from 35 to 21 percent, and it was made permanent in their bill. While household tax rate was cut so small that most American uh, households didn't even notice that they were giving a tax break. And, it was, and those small little tax breaks would expire by the year 2025. So there is an obvious difference between who they prioritize and who we prioritize. We prioritize the working class, the people who are struggling to get by. We prioritize transitioning from a fossil fuel economy to a green economy. We prioritize making our tax system fair, not that it benefits the wealthiest and the largest corporations in our country. Today, we have an opportunity which is historic in nature. We will make and expand the enhanced child tax credit that we passed in the American Rescue Plan that provides $250 to $300 per child on a monthly basis to families. I've had mothers, I had fathers come up to me with tears in their eyes to tell me how much this has already benefited them, that it makes them, um, help, helps them make the rent, helps them uh, put food on the table, helps them just get the little things so they don't struggle as much. I even had one a mother who had her husband die during the pandemic that left her with only one income to get by. This child tax credit also repeals the, the, the mean-spirited ban on immigrant children that would have impacted also Afghan children that are coming to this country. I'd like to thank my colleagues Judy Chu as well as Linda Sanchez for working on us to make sure that the repeal happened. Additionally, we're gonna have the largest investment in the green economy in the history of this country, but we're also doing it in a way that focuses on the people who are often on the other side of the green divide. We have included my bill, it's a used EV tax credit to make sure that working families had get access to EVs so they pay less in gas, so that they can commute in a more comfortable way, and that they get to participate in this transition. I would also say that we're having investments, not only um, when it comes to transportation, but to housing. Portions of my bills from uh, the new energy efficiency program, as well as the home energy efficiency program are included to reduce, reduce what people are paying when it comes to their electricity bills and their water bills. This is gonna have a tremendous impact on the working class people. Additionally, we see that we have a huge problem when it comes to housing in this country. And we're, because we've fought and fought to include the low income housing tax credit to build out approximately 1.3 to 1.4 million units of affordable housing in the next 10 years. This is gonna help with the supply issue. It's gonna help keep people housed to make sure more people don't become homeless. It is something that we have to continue to fight for and to expand. I'm proud that my provision to focus on extremely low-income individuals has it been included in this bill. 
Additionally, I want to talk about how we're trying to make the tax code fairer. One of the biggest crises we have is the growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots. The people who wake are in the top 1% versus the everybody else. My, this bill includes reforms to the, to the estate tax that the Republicans put in that benefited the wealthiest Americans. And this, with Representative Panetta's uh, bill to protect small family farms, is going to be transformative. We have to build back better, but in an equitable way that puts us in a good position for a 21st century economy and a 21st century workforce. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, to strike the last word. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to strike the last word. The gentleman word. is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this historic markup today. We are one step closer to building our country back better than ever before. And this is the moment to begin making our country a more equitable and just society. I want to highlight just some of the significant investments congressional Democrats on this committee are proposing. First, it is no secret that our nation is facing a housing crisis, and we must expand child uh, tax credits that increases affordable housing for individuals of every race and income level and prevents homelessness and evictions. The low-income housing tax credit and the new neighborhood homes tax credit are critical for my constituents in Nevada as we continue to close the development gaps in low-income and multifamily rental housing communities. The Low-Income Housing Renewable Energy Credit is also a major provision in this bill that will address racial equity by putting solar energy within reach for underserved communities while creating jobs, lowering energy bills, and strengthening our climate resilience. I'm excited to work with Representatives Davis, uh, Sanchez, Sewell, Evans, and Gomez on this important step forward for environmental and economic justice. These housing investments will not only create good paying jobs, but will ensure no one and no community is left behind as we build back better from the pandemic. Despite some of my colleagues continuing to deny the science, the existential threat of climate change is here and we are seeing it play out time and time again. In February of this year, more than 4.8 million Texas homes and businesses were left without power after, after a devastating winter storm. In the West, especially in my home state of Nevada, we're already seeing the impact of climate change and devastating wildfires, higher temperatures, and an extended drought. And last month, one of the most powerful hurricanes, Hurricane Ida, had devastating impacts in the southeast and northeast. If my colleagues cannot recognize these devastating toll and the impact on the loss of life as a result of climate change, then they must be living in a different reality. But we can address this problem. Today, the Ways and Means Committee, House Democrats are proposing the lead, and I'm proud to champion several pieces of legislation in the bill. Over the years to come, we need serious investments to expand the grid and carry clean power from the rural areas where it is produced to the high demand regions where it is most needed. That's why I introduced the Electric Power Infrastructure Improvement Act to provide a 30% investment tax credit for the construction of regionally significant transmission lines to improve our grid and to promote clean energy policy. And I'm pleased to see this included in the bill. In addition, my Dynamic Glass Act is part of this legislation, which would promote the deployment of dynamic glass to reduce uh, greenhouse gla uh, gas emissions, specifically addressing the nation's largest industry, commercial and residential buildings. There are many other priorities that I promoted in this legislation, including a production tax credit for solar, promoting sustainable energy fuels, a tax credit for energy storage, enhancing our electric vehicle tax credits and infrastructure, and prevailing wages and apprenticeship to create a clean energy job force. Finally, another significant investment and by far the most promising provision in this bill is the permanent extension of the child tax credit. We have already seen the benefits of the temporary child tax credit expansion from the American Rescue Plan, 
and how that has helped America's children. The overall monthly child poverty rate fell from 15.9% in June to 11.9% in July. The child tax credit has lifted 3 million children out of poverty in the first month alone. So I've listened to my colleagues today badger and talk down about people who needed a helping hand, but we also represent people um, who have been benefited. And this is not a program, it's a tax credit. Just like you give tax credits to the wealthy, we're providing tax credits to the middle class uh, and low-income families who need it. So I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman, and our staff for the incredible hard work. I'm ready to debate uh, the amendments that my colleagues on the other side will bring on, and I will just say that it's time for us to put the American people first uh, and not big business and major corporations. Thank the gentleman. I'd like to recognize Ms. Plaskett to strike the last word. I ask to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I looked this morning at the Wall Street Journal, not necessarily the most liberal paper that we have, and it said that the Democrats' plan would increase top corporate tax rates to 26% from 21%, impose a 3% percentage point sur surtax on people making more than $5 million a year and raise capital gains taxes. All of those things are being done to make those in the upper classes pay their fair share. And we're doing that because our Republican colleagues are unwilling to do it. They're afraid to do it, just as they're afraid of so many in their base who make them do things that I know privately they don't believe in. Republicans are completely inconveniently ignoring all of the investment in this bill that is being done by us doing that. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank this caucus and so many of us for working to achieve President Biden's and Congressional Democrats' vision to build back better, to build America back better, and those hardworking middle-class individuals in America who need that help, who want to be supported, who are not looking for handouts or programs to keep them down, but looking for a helping hand, a tax credit, so that they can achieve the American dream. The legislation before us today contains economic development initiatives that we all have been long championed to create good paying jobs, lowering costs, cutting taxes for American families. This bill also contains specific measures for much needed economic recovery from my home, of the U.S. Virgin Islands, for the territories, for tribes, for low-income communities, for rural areas, areas that have been left behind in so many ways when the Republicans enacted their bill in 2017. We are extending the changes made to the earned income tax credit in the American Rescue Plan. We're increasing the value of earned income tax credit for workers with no qualifying dependents, and we do that on a permanent basis here. In addition, we provided the look-back provision in the Consolidated Appropriation Act of December 2020. That is now and added as a permanent feature. This important part of the earned income tax credit <laughs> is premised on the idea that if taxpayers' earned income was less in a given year than it was in the prior year, the taxpayer may elect to use their prior year's earned income in computing their earned income tax credit. That is, this is a one-year look back, which will provide stability to taxpayers who have experienced income shocks in any given year, such as if they lost their jobs during hard times. We provide support for corporations to take earnings and take their debt over time. Democrats are trying to do that for the American people. Additionally, as all have talked about, we are expanding so much in the expansion and enhancement of the child tax credit, which will pull 3.6 million low-income children out of poverty, stabilizing millions of families' access to necessary like housing and food. We're establishing Neighborhood Homes Investment Act tax credit 
to support neighborhood stabilization and pathways to home ownership that I know so much of my colleagues, particularly Dwight Evans, who is always looking out for middle class homeowners by encouraging rehabilitation of affordable homes in low income communities so that those communities can stay, remain and look like what they always did with those individuals being homeowners by putting sales price caps, requirements of income for ownership, anti-flipping policies. We have environmental justice research credits. We have an enhanced ITC of up to 20% for solar facilities, affordable, renewable electricity to underserved communities as well. We are looking out for the American people every day, and particularly in this bill. We will get this done because we are concerned about the American people. I'm grateful for the support of this committee to ensure that the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, can compete in the Caribbean Basin against those other islands who have China recklessly investing in them. We'll be able to keep our hospitality, our tourism in place, and we'll also be able to support knowledge-based businesses coming and reversing the drain brain that plagues us so much. Thank you so much to the committee. Thank the gentlelady. And I yield back. Let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. First, we heard a, a long litany of uh, debunked statements about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, including the, the one told over and over and over again, which is 83% of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act went wealthy 1%, so I'd like to resubmit again uh, this document with all the factcheck.org uh, uh, fact checks uh, showing these claims are false. So ordered. Secondly, I don't have to submit this because it is in the law that is before us today, the proposed bill, but yes, under this bill, the existing EV credit is replaced with the new credit up to $12,500 refundable credit with, for individuals with incomes up to $862,000 for joint filers allowing them uh, this credit up to, for vehicles up to $74,000. Elon Musk thanks you. So ordered. Uh, and finally, um, it really is important that we listen to the voices of our job creators back home. And uh, they are weighing in against this legislation because of the damage it will do. do. National Restaurant Association, which employs so many Americans, especially those starting their first jobs, opposes this National Association of Manufacturers. As they note, uh, they created over 263,000 jobs uh, after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was put into law. That was the best in 21 years. And wages for the manufacturing workers went up the best since 2003. What they say is, these tax increases will lead to massive job losses, massive job losses, and they will hurt the ability of manufacturers in America to expand, to hire, to buy new equipment. We have similar statements from the American Petroleum Institute and the American Gas Association. National Association of Realtors make the case that the capital gains taxes will make it more uh, difficult to develop affordable housing in America. The home builders say that these high taxes, higher taxes, including on marginal rates, capital gains, will be passed along to new home buyers, hurting their ability to buy. We have letters from the National Retail Federation in opposition who makes the case that they will see a loss of jobs, perhaps closing stores, and as importantly, less investment to be able to compete in, in the e-commerce area. Main Street employers right, that these tax increases will handicap these, our businesses and communities for decades to come. International Franchise Associations say these tax increases penalize their businesses and the costs are borne by their workers. The Independent Community of Bankers of America say these tax increases are devastating to the continued independence of American small businesses. There are a number of other associations from the Business Roundtable through the American so Soybean Association who are submitting letters in opposition. Mr. Chairman, uh, I ask unanimous quint request, excuse me, to uh, uh, submit them. So ordered. Thank you, sir.
The chair is now prepared to proceed to the amendment stage of writing this legislation. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Reed is recognized. Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point Mr. of order. Mr. Chairman, I Okay, so Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order. Mr. Reed is recognized as soon as we pass out the amendment to speak amendment. upon the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Reed. I believe the amendment should appear in members' inboxes, and the amendment has been passed out. The gentleman is recognized to speak at his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the title of my amendment is, is the No Tax uh, Loopholes for Ivy League Elites Amendment. Uh, I can tell you, uh, American people uh, in particular hate hypocrisy, misrepresentation, and also uh, the activities of Washington, D.C., where folks take action based upon their political donors and uh, who's paying their campaign uh, coffers. I can tell you, when we looked at this bill and we saw that you had put in on the majority side uh, this endowment tax loophole for Ivy League elites, these are for endowments with over tens of billions of dollars that we as the Republican majority put into our tax cut bill to make sure that they weren't being abused, that those endowment dollars were not being uh, manipulated uh, in, in a way uh, that would be devastating uh, to those that are going to school or for those uh, were, that were manipulating uh, that endowment dollars for their own personal gain. I can tell you, uh, when I saw uh, this particular provision, uh, I was uh, quite aghast uh, because not only uh, do you change policy that will actually drive the college costs up with this provision. You are doing it when we looked at the public record. $8.8 .8 million was donated to members on the other side of the aisle in their campaign activities. This is a $2.5 billion tax provision that goes to the wealthiest of wealthiest, especially in the Ivy League arena. I guess a $2.5 billion benefit is worth the $8.8 .8 million dollars that were contributed to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Because what does this provision do? It essentially will incentivize that college costs go up. Because what you have done, let me just use a simple provision, a, a simple utilization of this provision. So the university today charges tuition of $50,000 and offers $10,000 per student in financial aid. Under your proposal, my Democratic colleagues, the schools can simply raise tuition to $60,000 and increase the financial aid to $20,000. In essence, the school, the school still gets the same net amount of tuition per student and yet avoids that $2.5 billion tax. What does that do to tuition costs? It drives tuition costs up. That is not smart policy. That is an intended uh, outcome, uh, I believe, to continue this cycle of college debt and increasing college costs in America, where you guys and we are incentivizing costs going up. There's nothing in this proposal that is going to lower college costs. You cover this proposal by saying you're encouraging financial aid to students. But I, as I just articulated in that simple uh, example, you are actually not doing that. You are not providing financial aid that's a net benefit to students because you're increasing their tuition costs. And you're doing it because elitists who have tens to $40 billion of endowment dollars uh, in these special accounts, that the American people have seen this story. They know what's going on. They know who's profiting from those dollars. They know who has unrelated business income in their operations, and they know that it's in their incentive for this tax to be repealed. So $8.8 .8 million of investment, and I've heard investment all day long, $8.8 .8 million worth of investment in this uh, uh, political arena sure makes sense when you get a $2.5 billion uh, benefit 
from the policy that is being proposed. So rather than creating tax loopholes and shelters for the elitists who don't need this, this benefit, why don't we actually do something that would get to the heart of the issue and lower college costs and not incentivize the increase like you, you indicated here? So I urge the adoption of my amendment and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. The gentleman has withdrawn his point of order. And the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Boyle, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Yes. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, this is, uh, I mentioned earlier how historic this is. This is now personally historic for me because for the first time in my life, I've been called an elitist. And I, I'm, I would like to thank the gentleman on the other side. I've never been considered uh, that, that way before. Second, and more seriously, as I mentioned as a first generation student myself, I am well aware that the universities that I attended used a percentage of their endowments in order to provide the significant student aid I needed in order to attend those universities. If the gentleman is concerned that the cost of college is too high in this country, I completely agree with him. The fact that we have $1.8 trillion of student debt right now is a disaster, not only for the individuals in repayment, which happens to, to include myself, but I think on our economy. Keep in mind, however, the Republican endowment tax of four years ago did nothing, literally not one dime, to reduce the cost of a higher education. The 1.4% tax simply went to the government with absolutely no provision whatsoever incentivizing or requiring these universities to spend a certain percentage of their endowment on student aid. What is in this democratic proposal does that. It doesn't eliminate the endowment tax, but it reforms it. It rewards those colleges and universities and gives them a credit based on the percentage of their endowment that they are using in order to invest in their students in terms of student aid. It is taking what frankly was a bad and clumsy Republican idea four years ago and reforming it to help incent those universities to do the right thing and reward those universities that are doing the right thing. So with that, uh, I urge a no vote on the gentleman's amendment, well, and I extend my hand to anyone on the other side who sincerely wants to tackle this problem of the cost of well, the college education in this country. With that, I yield back to the yep. chairman. The gentleman has yielded back his time. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on the amendment? Yes. The question that is on agreeing. Gentlelady from Alabama is recognized on um, to speak on the amendment. Mr. Speaker, I just, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just really wanted to echo uh, the sentiments of the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Um, you know, growing up in Selma, Alabama, I would have never been able to go to uh, Princeton or Harvard Law School had it not been for the fact that those universities had a uh, need-blind admission, meaning that people got in not based on whether they could afford to go there, but whether their merits and um, I can tell you that penalizing uh, these schools because they're quote unquote elite is just really not true. The reality is that the University of Alabama has a bigger endowment than some of these. The University of Texas has a bigger endowment than some of these uh, Ivy League schools. So I, I, I hasten to think that we're putting everything in um, all the schools and considering them under one rubric when ultimately it's what um, the Republicans fear from these universities that somehow that they're breeding liberals, um, and that's simply not true. Yes, I did go to, to Princeton, but so did uh, Ted Cruz. <laughs> and so I, I, would, I would venture to guess that uh, the United States Congress is not necessarily better off because he or I are in it, but rather that our philosophical views may be different, but nevertheless deserve uh, equal hair, uh, airing. Um, with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Yes. Um, I just want to address something that I'm a little bit confused about. Um, the author of the amendment said that there was $8 million in investment. And to my knowledge, uh, Terry Sewell, um, endowments are not allowed to make political contributions. Or am I, 
Am I missing the mark there? You're absolutely right. They're not. Well, the gentleman, gentlelady, yield. I, I, I will not. It's the gentlelady from Alabama's time, but I, I really do take umbrage at the mischaracterization that somehow these endowments are making political contributions, uh, because quite frankly, under the law, they're not allowed to. And with that, I, I yield back to the gentlelady. Yeah, I, I think that you're input. absolutely right on that, and and I think that what these endowments are allowing uh, these universities to do is to have uh, kids like Brandon Boyle and Terry Sewell an opportunity uh, to uh, t attend a university, uh, which I can tell you put me on a path um, to ultimately end up in the in the U.S. House of Representatives. So I think that um, I think the point has been made, and Mr. Chairman, I just want to. Uh, ultimately uh, ask my colleagues to vote against this amendment, and I think that um, the poster child is Brandon Boyle. I thank the gentlelady for, uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Georgia on the amendment, Dr. Ferguson. We will then proceed uh, to Mr. Beyer, and then we'll proceed to Dr. Winstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Reed from New York. The gentleman has yielded his five minutes to the gentleman from New York. Mr. Reed is recognized. I thank the gentleman. Uh, first of all, uh, obviously, uh, the American people understand well, endowments don't give money to individual members of Congress, but political contributors do. And that's where the $8.8 .8 million is. And as somebody who came out of school with $110,000 worth of debt and is the youngest of 12 raised by a single mother, I can tell you, going to college and uni university is something we should all aspire to. What fries me is when you have an elitist organization and a group of schools like the Ivy Leagues, like the 30 folks that are subject to this excise tax, abusing these provisions, using it to make millions of dollars, and now are incentivized under your proposals. No one responded to my simple uh, uh, fact scenario an example of what's going to go on here, you are incentivizing these institutions to raise their tuition even higher. That's all they care about. Keep raising tuition. That's the golden goose that keeps paying their dollars. And I'll tell you, I want kids to go to college. I went to college. I got a law degree by a single mother who taught me how to get ahead in life is to work hard and to go to school and have an opportunity. But I will tell you, these 30 institutions, they don't admit everybody across America. They don't let everybody onto their grounds. They pick and choose the folks that can go to their school. They pick and choose those uh, that uh, uh, they want to have into the club. And I will tell you what you're doing here is wrong. Because also, these institutions that have $40 billion of tax-free dollars sitting into these coffers plus, they don't, uh, uh, they don't uh, let everybody into their schools. They don't, you, they don't stop taking federal education money. They don't stop taking uh, money coming from state programs to offset costs for those students to go to that school. They keep sucking the dollars out, keep sucking the dollars out, while other institutions that do try to give an education like I got, that other folks did. Those folks are the ones that I'm fighting for here. The ones that don't have an opportunity to go to these institutions that got $40 billion sitting in their own endowments and should let the taxpayer dollars that are going to those institutions go to the other institutions so that they can lower their costs. One area we could agree on from my friend from Pennsylvania is you're darn right. When we got this endowment tax uh, on the books, I had other proposals that I wanted to put in there. I wanted full transparency. I wanted to make sure that everybody had a plan in this world to lower cost of tuition. Now you're solving the real problem. And I encourage people, if you want to work together and really incentivize lowering costs, I'm all in each and every day. And I thank the gentleman for yielding time. Thank the gentleman. Dr. Winstrup is recognized on the amendment. The, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. In the opinion no. of the chair, the no's have it. 
On that, we ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Brady has requested a recorded vote, and the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? No. Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis, no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez, no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Del Bene? Mr. Del Bene, no. Ms. Del Bene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Evans, no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Evans vote no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? Swazi, no. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Brady? Aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed is aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Rice votes aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood? Dr. Wenstrup? Yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Blumenauer? Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. LaHood? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 17 ayes. 25 nays and 17 ayes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there additional amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order to Mr. Estes' uh, amendment, and the gentleman is recognized to speak in his amendment as soon as the amendment is passed out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President Biden and the Congressional Democrats are sabotaging America's jobs recovery with crippling tax increases and anti-business policies that hurt working families and Main Street businesses and will drive U.S. jobs overseas. The underlying bill demonstrates that the Democrats are more interested in exorbitant Green New Deal provisions that raise energy prices and waste taxpayer dollars than they are in protecting Main Street family and businesses and their pocketbooks. In addition to wasteful spending, hundreds of billions of dollars of corporate welfare for green energy, they bring back the Superfund the super taxes that will cause all Americans to pay more at the pump 
and burden the working class by increased inflation on thousands of everyday household items. My amendment is simple. It repeals the Green New Deal provisions in the underlying bill, sheltering workers from wage reducing tax hikes and shield their packet pocketbooks from rising prices at the pump and overall inflation. This amendment puts real American families ahead of socialist wish list and political talking points. I urge adoption of my amendment and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Upon his point of order. Withdraw my point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman is recognized to speak on Mr. Estes' amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple points on, on this. For, first of all, the Green New Deal is not part of the measure that's before us. It may be convenient for the uh, gentleman in his amendment to try and vilify what we're doing by trying to attach it to something that in some circles may not have support, but it's just not accurate. Uh, the provision in this bill is the Green Act. It's a bill that incentivizes the use of renewable energies. And the specific purpose of this is to do two things. One, to reach certain climate change goals, and two, to create jobs. To suggest that this provision does anything short of creating jobs is misleading. And in regard to the climate change provisions of this, most people in America understand that we're at a crisis. As I said earlier in, in my opening remarks, a third of our country is underwater, a third of our country is on fire, and a third of our country has no water. We have a climate change crisis. In my district over the last three or four fire seasons, I have sadly lost constituents. People have died. People have lost their homes, their businesses, Thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres have burned. We have that same situation going on right now in a number of areas where fires are devastating communities. We need to take steps to address this issue. No longer, no longer is it acceptable to stick your head in the sand. This is a measure that will help our Communities will help our environment and will put people to work. This amendment should be rejected out of hand. Thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from West Virginia is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Chairman Neal and Ranking Member Brady. Much of the discussion on the other side of the aisle has revolved around whether wealthier Americans paying their fair share. While I agree with this sentiment, it is hard to take them at their word when this bill is chock full of giveaways to the upper class of American society. The Republican goal for our tax structure is to create an environment where businesses and the workers that they employ can thrive and create their own wealth. In reading this bill before us today, it seems that the Democrats are more concerned with currying favor with special interests and having the government not Americans choose winners and losers in our economy than they are with ensuring hardworking taxpayers have the opportunity to thrive. It's hard to imagine how giving a tax break of $12,500 to someone buying a $74,000 electric vehicle is a way to help working class workers. In the same vein, tax breaks for purchasing multi-thousand dollar electric bicycles seem to run counter to the goal of helping these Americans in need. I would like to see some of my colleagues try to ride a bicycle, electric or not, through the hills and hollers of southern West Virginia. And in the same way that Democrats here today are asking American workers to sacrifice more of their hard-earned paychecks because, let's be clear, workers bear the cost of tax increases on their employers. They are simultaneously subsidizing companies that are undermining American energy producers. Production tax credits have been in place for over a decade. Originally introduced to help a new renewable energy industry find a foothold. Since then, the industry has matured to a point where government subsidies are no longer needed to keep these companies afloat, but are used instead by activists to undermine other forms of American energy, especially the coal, oil, and gas companies who employ so many hardworking West Virginians in my district. 
it is well past time for Congress to phase out production tax credits or at least retarget them to help new and evolving technologies such as carbon <coughs> capture, not industries with significant market share and private investment. I yield back. I thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate what uh, the chairman of the select committee did, your leadership on the Green Act. These are vitally important. The urgency of the threat posed by climate change demands significant and rapid investment, continued investment in clean, renewable technologies, and the decarbonization of our economy. I'm hearkening back to the Republican tax plan. You remember, uh, in the dead of night, there was a proposal to repeal the uh, bipartisan agreement we had for the, the wind energy industry. And we had to basically embarrass our Republican friends to back down and allow it to proceed, not jeopardizing billions of dollars of investment. Uh, and there was no hearing, to the best of my knowledge, to destabilize the wind energy industry. This was just something that was conjured up as you were writing a bill as you were going along, with no public input on destabilizing the renewable energy industry. And luckily, you were embarrassed and you withdrew that. We're moving forward to be able to give the wind energy, the solar industry, other elements in terms of geothermal, a glide path to be able to accelerate further that development. Wind and solar projects have faced decades of uncertainty due to the starts and stop of federal tax credits, and as I mentioned, the Republican assault on wind energy that we had with your tax bill. In order to meet the President's goal of creating a net zero emissions power sector by 2035, this subtitles makes a robust investment in the deployment of these renewable energy technologies, which I will point out employ far more people than we have in the coal industry. And we have people in a number of your states who benefit from these provisions in Texas, in Kansas, uh, in Iowa. This is something that has had bipartisan support that we've worked hard to get. This is the culmination of that effort, and I strongly urge the rejection of this amendment. I, th I thank the gentleman. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Kansas. Mr. Estes, members are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor of Mr. Estes' amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, aye. no. No. In the opinion no. of in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I ask for a recorded vote. Mr. Brady has requested a recorded vote. Members are reminded, your camera must be turned on to be recorded. Members present via the WebEx platform are also reminded, please state your name before your vote. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? Larson, no. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez, no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? No. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider, no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? Swazi, no. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? 
Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunes? Nunes votes aye. Mr. Nunes votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed, aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice? Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Walorski votes yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Dr. Wenstrup? Wenstrup, yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? Yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. yes. Thank you. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Hearn, aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Rice? Aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. LaHood? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 nays and 17 ayes. There being 25 noes and 17 ayes, the amendment fails. Is there anybody else who wishes to offer an amendment to the amendment? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Rice. Smith. Yeah, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman has an amendment. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Thompson. I reserve a point of order. Mr. Thompson has reserved a point of order while we pass out Mr. Rice's amendment. And it appears in the inbox. Then the gentleman will be recognized on his amendment. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have to pause for a second and harken back to the recovery from the financial crisis in 2008 when Democrats, uh, the Obama-Biden administration, thought it would be a good idea to dramatically raise taxes, put in new government programs, and raise regulations. And the result of that was 10 years of stagnation or eight years of stagnation for our economy, a frustratingly slow recovery that should have been almost immediate. And then compare that to what happened in 2017 when we enacted the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act to make our country competitive. We undertook trade reform and regulatory reform. It's not that complicated. Our, our businesses just have to be competitive in the world. And if we can help them get there, then American workers can compete with anybody. And if we don't, if we put government on the backs of our businesses, then we will lose millions of American jobs. So now we come coming out of the coronavirus, we've had a astoundingly fast recovery. In one year, we've recovered far more in unemployment than we did after the Democrat big government, big tax proposals coming out of 2008. Uh, but you guys never learn. And you are, you are determined to go back to the same failed plan of the Obama-Biden administration by dramatically raising taxes on people who employ others, uh, by making our businesses unable to compete on the worldwide stage, and, and by creating massive government programs and more regulations that will drag down our economy again. And you will cost the job. Millions of American jobs will go overseas because of your efforts today. If this ever became law, and I doubt that it will, thankfully. Uh, but my amendment deals with a very small part of that. One, one uh, thing that I constantly hear folks on the other side of the aisle complain about is that big companies don't pay uh, enough in taxes, that their effective tax rate is too low. And what we have done here in these Green New Deal subsidies that are in this bill, we've provided for uh, basically refundable tax credits, money that will be paid directly to companies 
whether or not they owe any tax liability. So people like Amazon and so forth, who are going to invest in green energy anyway, uh, the government is going to pay them to do that uh, where we don't need to. They're going to do it anyway, but the government will pay them whether or not they owe taxes. So in fact, when you always complain about, for example, Amazon not paying any taxes, well, now, not only that, they're going to have negative taxes because the government's going to pay them for investing in these green, green New Deal subsidies. So it is striking to me that the very things you complain about, you're adding to in this bill. And what my amendment would do, it would strike these direct payment uh, of these Green New Deal tax credits to any company that has more than five million dollars in profit, so that if they don't owe a tax, they don't owe any tax, they won't be able to get these Green New Deal subsidies. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist upon his point of order? Withdraw my point of order. Mr. Gentleman has withdrawn his point of order, and the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that was very successful in the American Recovery Act was being able to provide a direct payment of the tax subsidy, uh, helping uh, avoid problems where there may not be enough tax appetite to deal with the credits. It was broadly supported. It had bipartisan support. It made a big difference for being able to scale up and accelerate these investments. We're still in a situation now of uncertainty. There's some that are very profitable. There's some that aren't. Being able to have the direct payment enables us to be able to cut through some of the uh, activities that, that take place in terms of uh, the friction, uh, ultimately getting the tax benefit. Um, I fail to see the benefit of undercutting efforts to try and accelerate this investment. Doesn't change the. Uh, overall budget economics, what it does is it speeds the money along the way. It makes it easier. It doesn't require a lot of the, uh, the tax planning and uh, the uh, other uh, activities uh, to be able to um, uh, make the tax credit work where there's not uh, the full tax appetite. It does it directly. It gives more bang for the taxpayer subsidy uh, by cutting out some of these extra steps and eliminating the tax fiction. This is something that has had broad bipartisan support. It's supported by industry. It will help accelerate what we need to do with these critical investments. Uh, I strongly urge the rejection of this amendment. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from California is recognized to speak on the amendment. If I could just comment on this uh, briefly. Uh, what we're doing here is trying to meet our uh, renewable and our clean energy goals as quickly as possible. Uh, this amendment would hamper that. This amendment would uh, remove the, the free market place provisions that our colleagues on the other side continue to talk about from reality. Uh, the way the bill is structured now, it allows us to uh, deal with economic conditions of the moment. And this would hurt that effort. Direct pay is key to unlocking the constraints of tax equity to meet our climate goals in the present time. I urge a no vote. Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Texas is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you. I'll be very uh, brief. This is more than a quarter of a trillion dollars of giveaways, mainly to the wealthy and to wealthy and successful businesses that don't need to be made. Unlike past tax credits, these aren't just credits. These are government checks written directly to companies that have the financial wherewithal and have proven to do that in making these clean energy investments. And this is a, an amendment that simply poses a question. 
in a bill where Democrats dole out five times more in green welfare subsidies than America spends on basic medical research at the National Institutes of Health each year, what are your priorities? In our view, issues uh, such as these renewable credits never end. Uh, my friend from Oregon sort of revisited history, or revised it a, a, a few minutes ago. I would point out Republicans, Democrats in 2015 came together, reached agreement to uh, end the 40-year ban on selling crude oil. I know I negotiated that for Speaker Paul Ryan at the time. In return for a phase down of the wind credits, or a phase out of the wind credits over a period of time, and a phase down of the solar credits over a period of time. There's reason for it, because wind's credits were at the time had been in place for a startup technology for a quarter of a century. And credits for solar, no longer a, so a startup credit, had been in place for a decade. Unfortunately, uh, advocates for the wind and solar uh, industry reneged on that agreement uh, and have pursued extending that. And in our view, it really is time for these mature industries, they are, by the way, making record levels of installation in the U.S., even though many of those are manufactured, unfortunately, in China, both the wind turbines and the solar panels as well. But nonetheless, making oh, pro progress toward renewable goals by spending their money, in my view, rather than spending taxpayer dollars. So this is, I think, a very reasonable amendment. Simply says, if you're a small business and can't afford to make the investments, we're going to help you. But if you're a major corporation with the wherewithal to advance those dollars yourself and receive very lucrative tax uh, credits, we're not going to cut you a check. We will incentivize you. I urge support for this amendment. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm going to speak in support of this amendment. I, f I find it remarkable oh. that the majority in this tax bill is saying that corporations should pay their share, fair share in taxes. They are raising the corporate rate and raising raising revenue on on our job creators and our and our innovators. What? Golden. Yet. They are going in through the back door and cutting their taxes by giving them a refundable credit. I, I believe that the American public is, is smart enough to see through this. You're, on one hand, you say we're going to punish American companies and innovators and job creators, but behind closed doors, you're going to give them money that belongs to the taxpayers. This is absolutely insane. And America's, Americans are going to see through this. The hypocrisy of this provision is remarkable to me. So I would like to thank the gentleman for offering this amendment. I stand in support of it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Are there, are there any other members who wish to speak on the amendment? The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith is acknowledged to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I know that Mr. Thompson spoke about uh, or reflected on the, the free market nature that he is apparently aiming for, but I guess I would like clarification just, just for, for clarity. The proposal is to overall increase corporate, the corporate tax rate to then take that revenue and give it to preferred companies who do, who, who meet the expectations or the demands of the text of, of the law. Would that be accurate, Mr. Thompson, if you would yield? No, it, it wouldn't be accurate. Uh, what we're trying to do is to change the tax code to incentivize the use of renewable energy. Right, and so the resources to achieve that would be generated by increasing taxes on the, on the same companies that would be receiving some benefits back. Would that be accurate? Not necessarily. Okay, I, thank you. I, I guess that, that's not the clarity that I was hoping for, <laughs> uh, because it would appear to me that 
The proposal is to increase the rates on all corporations and then take those resources and hand those out to companies that do what apparently is, is, is the priority of this text. So I, I think there will be a lot lost in, in the transfer of these dollars and the overhead of, of um, the administration of all of this. And I, I just think uh, we, we can do a lot better in terms of establishing priorities and hopefully um, meeting the needs of our economy and, and providing a brighter future for all Americans. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. The question is on agreeing to the amendment. Members are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, aye. no. No. The no. The, in the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. I ask for a recorded vote. Brady votes. has asked for a recorded vote. And the clerk will please call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? Larson, no. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? Blumenauer, no. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell, no. Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez votes no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins, no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Del Bene? Ms. Del Bene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Mr. Boyle? Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? Swazi, no. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Gomez, no. Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Brady? Brady votes aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Reed, aye. Mr. Reed votes aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Mr. Kelly votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes aye. Mr. Rice? Rice votes aye. Mr. Rice votes aye. Mr. Schweikert? Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Walorski votes aye. Ms. Walorski votes aye. Mr. LaHood? Dr. Wenstrup? Dr. Wenstrup votes aye. Dr. Wenstrup votes aye. Mr. Arrington? Mr. Arrington? Dr. Ferguson? Aye. Dr. Ferguson votes aye. Mr. Estes? Mr. Estes votes aye. Mr. Smucker? Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Hearn, aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. LaHood? Mr. Arrington? Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. Clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chair, I have 25 nays and 16 ayes. There being 25 noes and 16 ayes, the amendment fails. Are there any other amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The gentleman from Georgia, Dr. Ferguson, is recognized. Mr. Thompson. You. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman has reserved a point of order. 
We will await passing out the amendment, and then Dr. Ferguson will be recognized on his amendment. <clears throat> the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go back to the uh, conversation we've been having about the EV tax credits. Um, I, I found it pretty remarkable that during, when we were asking technical questions that we saw a complete unleveling of the playing field w between American workers. Not, not, not American workers and uh, foreign workers, but American workers right here and the differences between those that are in places like Detroit and Ohio, those hardworking Americans that are out there producing vehicles for America, but also those that are in states like mine and my, my colleague from, from Alabama, Ms. Sewell. And so just as a quick summary on the EV tax credits, there's a $4,000 base tax credit. Um, if you get the bigger battery, as uh, Mr. Barthold has said, you get another 3500 but then, in a special giveaway to uh, the leadership of unions and political contributors, there's an additional $4,500 for union labor. Now, that's not right, and that's unfair to treat workers and plants differently in one state and not another, and, and that's, not, that's not right by the federal government. And I should probably be offering an amendment to deal with that. But one thing that I know when it comes to the majority party, when it comes to the, the leadership of the unions and the political con, uh, contributors, y'all are like bird dogs pointing. You just can't help yourselves. You're going to go with them every single time. So I'm going to offer an amendment on something that y'all have all agreed is something that, uh, or at least is a mantra of this, of this bill, and that it, the, the help should really go to the Americans that need it the most and that the wealthy should not get there should should not get a a bigger cut than those that are out there working every single day. So, what my amendment would do is it would reduce the maximum income income threshold for EV tax credits from eight hundred thousand dollars for a couple to one hundred and fifty thousand or seventy five thousand for single filers. Now. We arrived at these numbers based off of economic impact payments in the last, in the last relief package. So clearly there is, the, the, the majority thinks that that is a number, 75,000 for an individual and 150,000 for, for joint filers, that that's, where, that's the part of America that needs help. But under this bill, you're gonna give help to folks that are making 800,000, couples that are making $800,000 a year. Let me refer you to the chart behind me, and let's look at what we're doing to subsidize the wealthy in this tax bill. $11,100 in tuition savings, $12,500 tax credit for a Tesla Model 3 for a college freshman, a $12,500 tax credit for a Model Y for the parents. Okay, so we're gonna get to kids and the parents a Tesla, a $1,300 tax credit for a home energy audit, $18,000 tax credit for a hydrogen fuel cell system for the house, a $10,000 tax credit on geothermal heat, heat pump system for the second home, and a $52,550 $52, tax saving on, uh, from the salt tax shelter. So basically, if you're wealthy living in a, in a blue state, you're going to get $118,000 in tax credits. $118,000 in tax credits. Up to $800,000 for somebody making $800,000 a year. That is a heck of a giveaway to the top earners in this country. And hey, look, I'm all about competition, and I'm, more, I'm, I'm about every American keeping their hard-earned tax dollars. But doing it on the backs of those that are making below 150000 as a couple and $75,000 as an individual seems a bit hypocritical to me. So, Mr. Chairman, I submit this amendment to reduce the, income, the, the tax credits available from $800,000 down to $150,000 for a couple 
and urge the support and adoption of this amendment. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Thank the gentleman. Does the gentleman from California continue to insist on his point of order? I withdraw my point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman has withdrawn the point of order. Mr. Kildee is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, against the amendment. Um, look, I understand the point the gentleman's trying to make. And I understand that the real point is that our friends on the other side don't support any of these provisions that are intended to deal with the most pressing uh, challenge that we face as a planet, and that is climate change. This is intended to get at that by matching the scale of the problem with the solution that is intended to deal with the most significant contributor to greenhouse gas, and that's the transportation sector. I also uh, uh, want to say that I support the goal that the President of the United States laid out that in addressing these big questions, in bringing to his desk an effort to solve the big problems we face and have a tax code that is more fair, that we would ensure that individuals making $400,000 or less would be protected from those increases, and that would include the provisions that we included in this particular piece of legislation. So if we're going to deal with this, we have to deal with it at scale. We have to make sure that we not only have a tax code that keeps that promise, which I happen to uh, believe in, uh, but also goes some distance in solving the problem. Now, truth of the matter is, the minority had a chance to deal with this question before. Ranking member mentioned in 2015, they went through some of the clean energy credits. But in 2017, when the Republicans were in the majority, they went through the entire tax code line by line to find any fault that they wanted to correct. Now, of course, I disagreed vehemently with the conclusions they came to. But what they did in that instance was to leave in place the electric vehicle tax credit with no limit at all on income with no limit at all on the price of the vehicle that would qualify for the credit. So your position in 2017 was anybody of any income level should be able to buy any car of any price and achieve and, and receive this credit. Our view is that's not the case. And I, I did mention earlier in the conversation there was a, uh, a suggestion that a person making $750,000 could buy an $80,000 vehicle and get the credit. Simply not true. A sedan is capped at $55,000, that was the reference. An individual is capped at what the President said, and we can debate that. We can debate whether or not that's the right threshold, I get it. But it's, at the end of the day, I think the President's judgment was right. Nobody making more than $400,000 should receive these benefits. People below that level shouldn't receive an increase, and that includes the tax benefits that the current electric vehicle tax credit provides. With that, I urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. On the amendment, Mr. Kelly is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, on the, on the last conversation, we're actually talking about your bill today, not, not our bill uh, from several years ago, but I would like to bring this up because two of us sit on this panel, in fact, three of us sit in this panel, they're actually in the automobile business. Now, this may seem strange to some of you, but in the 67 years that my family's been in business, rarely, rarely does anybody put any type of an incentive on a vehicle if it's market ready, you usually have to incentivize something that's not market ready to force it into somebody's decision making process. So you say, you know what, these models aren't moving, so let's put a $2,500 rebate or a $3,500 rebate, uh, whatever. But those are the manufacturers saying that. They're going to reduce the price of their offering by such and such a, a rebate. Why in the world would you expect hardworking American taxpayers to fund this idea? You know, you're trying to get from maybe two and a half to three and a half percent of the total market with this idea that somehow electric vehicles are the solution to our energy problems in the future. 
Well, you know what? Uh, again, I'll go back to anything that is market ready does not need to be subsidized. And if it is going to be subsidized, why not be subsidized by the people who actually produce it, manufacture and put it on the road? Why would you tell hardworking American taxpayers, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer, well, this is a car or truck you can possibly afford, but we're going to ask you through a tax system to go ahead and subsidize a purchase of a vehicle that maybe two and a half to three and a half percent of the American people would actually be interested in buying. And those people that can't afford to even buy halfway decent transportation, we're telling them, hey, you, you all just have to wait your turn. Maybe sometime in the future one of these cars will get traded in and it'll be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of what you can afford. This makes absolutely no sense to anybody who's really in business. And I'm not talking about a business that works on taxpayer subsidies to keep bailing it out. And we keep throwing around this figure of $30 trillion in debt. We are not $30 trillion in debt with funded and unfunded liabilities. We are $130 trillion in debt. That is real money to real people and really should be the issue. Why in the world would you think that somehow subsidizing the highest earners in the country to buy a vehicle that they could buy themselves if they really wanted it, Hell, most of these people buying these cars don't drive them every day. They just like to have them. They buy homes that are bigger than they need. They buy a lot of things that they don't really need, but they buy them because they can. I support any, any consumer that wants to use his or her own money to buy one of these vehicles. God bless them, buy it. You dangled years ago money in front of the manufacturers and say, we will give you billions of dollars to develop one of these vehicles. And they said, well, why would we do that? Nobody wants to buy them. You said, well, but it will give you money to go ahead and, and move that forward. That is about as bass backwards as you can get. But we continue to do that. We are so smart in this Congress that we will make decisions on how to go to market. And we'll do it, Mr. and Mrs. Taxpayer, by using your hard-earned money to subsidize it. This is a vehicle that may have some kind of market sometime in the future, but it's going to be to a very small group of Americans. Not the 97 or 98 percent of people that buy cars and trucks. They're not looking to buy these vehicles because, quite frankly, they can't afford them, even with the huge subsidies from the federal government. My family's been in business since 1953. Never before have I seen the government want to subsidize a vehicle. If it needs to be subsidized, the manufacturers usually will move those because, you know what, they sit on the lot too damn long and they get tired of paying interest on their floor plan. So they knock the price down. That's the way it works. The only place it doesn't work is a place like this that you don't have to use your own money and you keep printing stuff, I would ask you all to please look at the M1 money supplies and tell me if, if you didn't know it was our treasure, you'd swear to God counterfeiters got loose and started printing money and throwing it all over the place. We are going down the wrong road and continue to go down the wrong road and to absolutely have the gall to tell hardworking American taxpayers, oh, you folks that can't afford these vehicles, don't worry about it. We're going to use your dollars to subsidize the rich that can. And with that, Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple of things. First and foremost, uh, this is where America is going. It's not just America. We're watching the phase out of internal combustion engines in Europe. We're hearing major companies in the United States talking about making these changes. There's going to, it's going to take a while to be able to get this in place. There's going to be some disruptions and whatnot. Uh, it is entirely appropriate to continue to provide some subsidies to accelerate this transition. Now, I, I hear my friend from Pennsylvania talking about the free market. You know, as somebody who owns a car dealership, he knows there isn't a full free market for automobiles. You know, you, a, an automobile, a franchise was an opportunity to have a corner of that market. Uh, there is not a free and fair market in terms of being able to buy and sell automobiles. That is an indirect subsidy. Well, the gentleman to, yield. No, I'm not. Because you don't know what you're talking about. Well, thank you. Thank you. That, that, you this just, is, you just made it very of, clear to the rest of this part body. Of the, part of the, Rules the Elon time. Musk uh, opportunity in terms of people being able to go out and uh, have a franchise to sell vehicles. This is tightly controlled. Um, 
But my point here is it's entirely appropriate for us to accelerate this, looking at the distribution uh, chart that people are going to see. Uh, the, there is going to be, uh, in uh, tax year 2023, um, the people who make 200000 or less are going to see a reduction in their overall rate. So it's not like lower and moderate and middle-income people are subsidizing this. There will be changes at the upper income levels, and I think that's entirely appropriate. But having an opportunity to accelerate this business, to be able to provide incentives, because we're all going to be better off with zero emission vehicles in terms of air quality, in terms of energy. And, you know, my friends had no problems maintaining subsidies for the most profitable uh, industry for years, oil and gas, that continues to get massive subsidies every single year. It's after a century. With my good friend, the ranking member, you know, he's not willing to phase out those after over a century. I think it's a bit hypocritical to not be able to provide incentives for industries for the future that will help us meet our challenges of the environment. And I would yield to my dear friend from Flint, who may have some observations about this. I thank my, uh, my friend for yielding. And, and I do think it's important to point out, number one, the future is electric. Uh, it is going to happen. The question is whether or not we're going to build these vehicles here in the United States through a set of incentives that gets us ahead of this curve and not miss what we missed back in the early 1970s when the American auto industry was flat-footed. That's one of the questions. But the other point that I want to make is lots of folks support this. And, and I, I, I consider my friend from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, a, a friend. I like talking cars with him. We make them. You sell them. So I, but I would just like to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, without uh, as a unanimous consent request, that the statement of the National Auto Dealers Association supporting the provision that I have helped to author, they support this legislation. So that ordered. be included as part of the record. With that, I yield back to the gentleman from Oregon. The gentleman from Oregon controls the time. Yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Swiker, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is one of those moments that I will beg of my brothers and sisters in this room and on, <laughs> on WebEx to think a little bit broader. Um, I'm going to speak in support of the gentleman's amendment. But for those of us who want, wish to cut spending, for those of you who wish to, as, you, as the rhetoric is, to have the wealthy pay their fair share, could I at least have wish we have an honest conversation? Because Mr. Kildee came very close to actually nailing this in part of what he was saying. You do realize we do a massive subsidization of the wealthy. Um, and for the record, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit a um, article from Brian Riddell at the Manhattan Institute. This is almost one trillion over 10 years so ordered. of subsidies and some other documents that we'll have to put together from our office where we've been looking at other types of subsidies from flood insurance to now solar panels to car to these things where we are subsidizing the very top income earners in society. And look, I, I'm a guy, I'm on the waiting list for the electric Ford F-150. So, and I've driven, my wife has driven a Ford hybrid for a decade, we love it. But we can't have it both ways where we say, well, we want to tax the rich, so we're going to raise the income taxes and the capital gains tax and all these others over here. But on the other hand, we're going to hand them back the cash for buying these things. I, I appreciate the political influence that comes with the washing machine where um, lobby me on the tax side and lobby me on the credits and the, the, the cash back to you side, but it's a little perverse. We as a committee need to have an honest conversation uh, if we need more resources, and for those of us who desperately want to cut some of the spending, stop subsidizing the wealthy. And you saw the graphic here. I mean, I, I know this is just a thought experiment, but this is over a hundred grand of direct subsidy 
eligible to a family making $800,000 a year. I mean, that doesn't fit anyone's rhetoric in this room, but that's what's in the legislation. So, look, maybe it's time, and, and, and I know it's hard to do in front of a camera in a markup where you've been handed a bill from on high and you're not allowed to accept amendments, but at some point we need to have an honest conversation that if you want to tax the wealthy, maybe the solution is not raise the taxes because of the economic distortions it creates. Maybe it's time to just stop subsidizing them. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Right, the gentleman. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, is recognized on the amendment. Well, the good news is my friends on the other side of the aisle, they got a new Ferrari, uh, 700, 700 horsepower, just came out, all electric. Uh, so get your orders in. With that, I yield to Mr. Mr. Kelly, thank you. Thank my fellow auto dealer. Um, by the way, I, you know, people ask about the importance of auto dealers and the fact that uh, only the very privileged few get to be franchisees. That, uh, that kind of flies in the face of everything that, that people understand when it actually comes to markets and what free markets are. But um, I would also ask all of you, for those of you who do not think having a local dealer is important, please go to where you're communities play Little League Baseball or Pony League Baseball or American Legion Baseball and go look at the outfield fence and see whose name's on there as a sponsor. Go to any high school play and look and see who it was that sponsored all this wonderful young talent because it usually comes from your local merchants and primarily from automobile dealers. Um, we're at the head front of every, every single drive to try and, and raise money to help somebody who needs it. But I want to get back to this electric vehicle thing. I just don't understand why in the world we are subsidizing the wealthiest people in America Not the to buy what they consider to be a trinket. Uh, you know, it's something they like to have in their driveway. Uh, the everyday person who needs to get to work is not in a situation to buy one of these electric vehicles, but yet we're going to pour all kind of incentive monies on people who can't afford them without even thinking about it and say, no, these are the people we want to give the special break to. First of all, I'm going to get back to this. If this vehicle, if this product would stand on its own, then yeah, fine, do it. Why are we subsidizing manufacturers and buyers of these vehicles say, please build these cars because you stupid folks don't understand. This is the car of the future. Says who? Says who? Says we. And who is we? I have no idea who these brainiacs are. But I do know that 97% or 98% of the American people are not buying these cars, despite the fact that you all call it the vehicle of the future. I, I have no idea how you come to those, those conclusions. But again, I'm going to go back to what I said from the opening of this until today. We are already $130 trillion in debt and funded and unfunded liabilities. If you really want to get back on the beam and get yourself straightened out, don't stop giving money away to people who don't need it. Don't stop. Why would you push a product that only 3% of the American people could possibly afford or want to buy? Hell, why don't we subsidize those people that have to buy a used car and say, listen, we're going to give you a little more. Now, if you buy an EV car, a used EV will give you some money. But hey, listen, if you're just buying that little burner, that little gas burner to get you back and forth to work so you can put food on the table for your family and get a little money for your kids, in the future, yeah, you, the people like you, don't, you don't get this. You don't get this. Look, this is so blatantly unfair to American taxpayers. This is so gamed in one direction. And I do understand. I've been to Flint. I've been where they build Buicks. I understand where they build GMC trucks and Chevrolet trucks. Chevrolet trucks are the, are the backbone of, of our industry. Uh, I, I just I look at this and I say, why are we having these conversations in an entity that could never, we can't even keep track of what we spend. We have no idea, but we keep saying it's all right. I keep hearing people tell, why the wealthiest country in the world can't do all these things? And the reason we can't is because it's not possible to sustain that type of spending. It's just not possible. This is not all about glitter and unicorns. This is not all about selling people, listen, we're the ones that really care. We're the ones that want to shower you with all these benefits. 
And by the way, who's going to have to pay more? I keep hearing the wealthy aren't paying their fair share. When you look at the way taxes are divided, I'd say the wealthy are doing pretty well as far as supplying the revenue. This idea on electric vehicles, though, please wake up. This is 25 to 3.5% of the market. Unless we force the market as an entity, a government entity that can regulate anybody out of business that we want to. And we can tax anybody out of business that we want to. The question is, why do we want to? I know where the market lies. I've been in it my whole life. I know how I make payroll. I know how it is that we're able to participate in all community activities and fundraising. Please, don't look at the shining object here thinking that EVs are the solution for the future. If they just aren't. They aren't. And when you do get market ready, you're not going to have to subsidize anybody. And when sales fall, I guarantee you that the people that build them will come up with all kinds of incentives for you to go and buy that vehicle. Don't ask hardworking American taxpayers to fund these dreams, these electric dreams. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania to speak on the amendment. Mr. Schmucker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to yield my time to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Schmucker. The gentleman Schmucker. has yielded his time, and the gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I want to get a couple of things straight that we've learned today in all of this. Um, okay, first of all, the folks that are going to be paying the bulk of the excise tax on tobacco make under $200,000 a year. I think uh, Mr. Barthold said in excess of 80% of folks are going to be doing that. Okay? We're then going to turn around and raise the corporate rate on a company like Amazon, and then we're going to turn around and give them a direct federal subsidy. So we are paying wealthy corporations a direct subsidy. And on top of that, if you are a family making $800,000 a year, you're going to get 100 and you can get up to $118,000 worth of tax credits. Think about that. Let that let that soak in for just a minute. If you're at the lower end of the of the spectrum, the majority is about to make you pay higher taxes and all the while the corporations that they're trying, that they that they also often demonize, and the folks making eight hundred thousand dollars a year are about to get one hundred and eighteen thousand dollars in in tax credits. That simply does not make sense. But there are a couple of other things that I want to touch on with this bill. One of the concerns that I have, and, and look, if we want to get to the point that we drive electric vehicles and that's the best car on the market, then absolutely we should. I've driven these things; they're fun, they're fast, they're quick. A lot of advantages to them. But we also need to recognize that we are trading our dependence on oil from OPEC right now because we've given up our energy independence. But we're going to be giving, we're going to trade that dependence on foreign energy from fossil fuels with OPEC to rare earth minerals coming from China because we don't have the supply chain built up here in the U.S. to build the very things that we want to. And so we don't have a plan for that. We have a plan to pay other people to do it for us, but we don't have a plan to build up our supply chain to produce the very things that we need to produce here. So we're trading dependence on foreign oil for dependence, rare earth minerals, and batteries from China. That simply does not make sense either. Other issue that I have with this, with this bill, and the way that it is written on this EV tax credit is the, is the unfairness between American that, that, it, that it lays out for American workers. I don't think that the workers in my district that work at the Kia plant and my colleagues' workers from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, or her workers in Tuscaloosa at the Mercedes plant or in Hyundai, that they should be, they should be treated differently than those workers in Mr. Kildee's plant. So it's just the way this thing is laid out. I, look, always put American workers at a competitive advantage over the world. I think we can all agree that's a good thing to do. But I think pitting Americas in one state versus another through a direct subsidy is, is wrong. And keep in mind, I'm not saying do away with the tax credit here, okay? So let's, let's not pretend that we're not that that's what this amendment is about. This amendment is about limiting it to those Americans that actually need it the most as defined 
by who got the stimulus payments. $75,000 for an individual, $150,000 for a couple. So, again, the amendment is about putting a cap on this. And we in this room need to recognize that if you're, that if you're doing well, you're about to do a whole lot better because of $118,000 worth of tax credits coming your way. And if you're at the lower end of the spectrum, you're about to be paying more in taxes. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Uh, the, Mr. Thank the gentleman. No, go ahead. No, no. Mr. Ferguson had 40 seconds no, on the no. clock, Mr. Brady. Oh, sure. Okay. I'll be very brief. Look, the difference here is the old EV credit was capped for companies at 200000 This one makes it permanent for all. Uh, it was not refundable, so you actually had to pay taxes. This one, you send government checks. The choice of Dr. Ferguson's uh, amendment is very simple. Do we subsidize people making $800,000 a year, or do we help two teachers? Do we subsidize up to $74,000 electric truck, or do we do the average? And by the way, before you vote, just know the Senate three weeks ago approved a limit of $40,000 uh, for the cars and 100000 uh, on individuals' income. So you know while you're voting for the, to preserve this tax break for the wealthy today, it's not coming back to you this way. Thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, is recognized to speak on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to uh, thank the gentleman uh, from uh, Georgia for, um, you know, r really bringing to attention um, a problem that our side understands very well. In fact, uh, Mr. Kildee has been gracious enough to work with me uh, so that we can level the playing field. I think that EVs are the wave of the future, but I also believe um, that we should not, uh, that we have to level the playing field, that there shouldn't be a, a choice between um, unionized versus ununionized workers. And I want to th thank the, the gentleman from Michigan for uh, engaging uh, in uh, a conversation about that, as well as to his commitment to seeing what we can do uh, to level the playing field. In the state of Alabama, you know, um, we have over 13,000 um, auto workers um, that work between Mercedes, Hyundai, Honda, and uh, Toyota uh, in our state. And so we we are we obviously want to do everything we can to level the playing field, but at the same time acknowledge that um, America should lead when it comes to EVs. And, um, and leading the way means also leading the way in terms of wages and labor standards and, and the like. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield uh, some time to uh, Mr. Kildee uh, from Michigan and again thank him for his leadership on what we all see as a very important part of um, the, Green, um, the Green Act. And so I just wanted to thank you for your leadership on this and also your willingness to work with me um, to address the, the point of leveling the playing field. I thank the gentlelady for yielding. Uh, I thank her for her work on this uh, and for your support of the American auto industry. I've always enjoyed working with you to support American auto workers. And I understand that you have these concerns with the electric vehicle credit, including how we incentivize electric vehicles to be made here in America. I know that we share the goal of supporting American auto workers as our country transitions from combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles so we can both create good paying jobs while meeting our climate goals. And I am committed to working with you to try to address your concerns as this bill continues to move to the House floor. With that, I yield back to the gentlelady. Uh, thank you so much. And I, again, just want to say that, you know, I have um, the utmost respect and have a, a very strong pro-union voting record. This is really not about that. It's really about leveling the playing field so that American workers lead in this industry. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentlelady. The question is on agreeing to the amendment, and members are reminded to unmute themselves for the voice vote. All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. A recorded vote. Mr. Request. Brady has requested a recorded vote. Members are reminded that your camera should be turned on to be recorded. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Doggett? Doggett votes no. Mr. Doggett votes no. Mr. Thompson? Thompson, no. Mr. Thompson votes no. Mr. Larson? No. Mr. Larson votes no. Mr. Blumenauer? No. Mr. Blumenauer votes no. Mr. Kind? Kind, no. Mr. Kind votes no. Mr. Pascrell? Pascrell votes no. 
Mr. Pascrell votes no. Mr. Davis? Davis votes no. Mr. Davis votes no. Ms. Sanchez? Sanchez no. Ms. Sanchez votes no. Mr. Higgins? Higgins no. Mr. Higgins votes no. Ms. Sewell? Sewell votes no. Ms. Sewell votes no. Ms. Delbene? No. Ms. Delbene votes no. Ms. Chu? Chu votes no. Ms. Chu votes no. Ms. Moore? Moore votes no. Ms. Moore votes no. Mr. Kildee? Mr. Kildee votes no. Mr. Boyle? Boyle votes no. Mr. Boyle votes no. Mr. Byer? Byer votes no. Mr. Byer votes no. Mr. Evans? Evans votes no. Mr. Evans votes no. Mr. Schneider? Schneider votes no. Mr. Schneider votes no. Mr. Swazi? Swazi, no. Mr. Swazi votes no. Mr. Panetta? No. Mr. Panetta votes no. Ms. Murphy? Murphy votes no. Ms. Murphy votes no. Mr. Gomez? Mr. Gomez votes no. Mr. Horsford? Mr. Horsford votes no. Ms. Plaskett? Plaskett votes no. Ms. Plaskett votes no. Mr. Brady? Aye. Mr. Brady votes aye. Mr. Nunez? Nunez votes aye. Mr. Nunez votes aye. Mr. Buchanan? Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Buchanan votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska? Smith votes aye. Mr. Smith of Nebraska votes aye. Mr. Reed? Mr. Reed? Mr. Kelly? Yes. Mr. Kelly votes yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri? Smith of Missouri votes yes. Mr. Smith of Missouri votes yes. Mr. Rice? Mr. Rice? Mr. Schweikert? Yes. Mr. Schweikert votes yes. Ms. Walorski? Walorski, yes. Ms. Walorski votes yes. Mr. LaHood? Mr. LaHood? Dr. Wenstrup? Dr. Wenstrup, yes. Dr. Wenstrup votes yes. Mr. Arrington? I'm a yes. Mr. Arrington votes yes. Dr. Ferguson? Yes. Dr. Ferguson votes yes. Mr. Estes? Yes. Mr. Estes votes yes. Mr. Smucker? Aye. Mr. Smucker votes aye. Mr. Hearn? Hearn, aye. Mr. Hearn votes aye. Mrs. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Miller votes aye. Mr. Reed? Mr. Rice? Mr. LaHood? Mr. Chairman? No. Mr. Chairman votes no. The clerk will report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have 25 no's and 15 ayes. There being 25 no's and 15 ayes, the amendment fails. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Rice? How am I recorded? Belatedly. <laughs> How would the gentleman I'm like sorry. to be recorded? Aye. <laughs> uh, okay, that, that's okay. All right, uh, Mr. Rice. Without objection, Mr. Rice's his vote is recorded. Mr. Rice, Mr. Chairman, if you're in a comfortable mood, aye. Reed could be an aye, if you want to mind, Mr. Chairman. All right, all right, hold on one second. Just, why don't we just sit, get that done quickly? I'm, I'm okay with that, but we've got to pay more attention to it yeah. as we move along. Without objection, Mr. Reed is recognized as well. Mr. Reed is recorded as Thank aye. Thank you, Mr. Without objection, the clerk will then re-report the tally. Mr. Chairman, I have a tally of 25 no's and 17 ayes. There being 25 no's and 17 ayes, the amendment fails. We're going to pause for a moment while technology updates. <laughs> I think that that might be applicable in a couple.